Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Yeah, I hear him chat to the noise. Go too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls let it tell me I'm awesome. Yeah, hot like fire on the pan. If you wanna touch my please use caution. Call like the road to do. I'm out the cage, gotta let out the beast. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the, 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 the sheets. We came from one man, forget about peace. We take the west side, take on the east. I'ma put him in the cage, never let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the. I am chopped to the noise, move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I am chopped with the boys, not so tough, but man's keep walking, yeah. Just too sharp with the boys, white girls, let it tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pan, if you wanna touch my feet. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. I had a way that I wanted to start this uh, that included uh, Richard Lewis, uh, thoughts on Richard Lewis, a friend of the show, and um, an assortment of other things that I wanted to talk about. But I was legitimately surprised right before we started today because... A part of me I thought was dead until moments ago, until I saw it out of the corner of my eye. Thought it was dead, thought this part of me as a sports fan had been buried, never to return. Out of the corner of my eye on one of the televisions, one of the televisions was a little bit brighter than all the others. Not because they're any different in color and tint, but because of the amount of sunshine coming through one of the televisions that is in here. A brighter sunshine than anywhere else. And I'm like, oh, spring. The televised sports pitchers and catchers have reported. Otani has hard launched a wife this morning out of nowhere that none what? of us knew about. <laughs> P's and C's. That's correct. Uh, there I don't I can't read the Japanese. Jeremy, help me here. You're fluent in Japanese, are you not? Yeah, for sure. Uh the translation. To all of my friends and fans throughout, I have an announcement to make. Not only have I began a new chapter of my life with the Dodgers, but I have also began a new life with someone from my native country of Japan who was very special to me, and I wanted everyone to know I am now married. I am excited for what is to come, and thank you for your support. To whom it may concern. I mean, real amateur move, right? We just had Spolster in town uh, sign an extension after he got divorced. Otani's doing it the other way. Uh, we Americans have it all backwards. Uh, or he, forwards. He's got... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you. This, what do you mean me? What do you mean me? Did, did you forget? <laughs> Speaker Truth why, King. Well, yes, that's how you... <laughs> I thought, you're not supposed to do it as <clears> Tony. <throat> it's as a gacky. You got to do it as a Forward. gacky. And sometimes it's actually his thoughts, Dan. I, I, that one was me. But he can disguise them all as a gacky and protect the character. That one got through. The character of Tony. That's what I'm saying. It happens sometimes. It's, you know. a, it's a safe space we for him. We created this device for a reason. <laughs> yes, I mean, so it could be slightly <laughs> less of an People echo chamber. Around. We'll talk to you about Mitch McConnell in a second. But Thank you. I was legitimately surprised. <laughs> I was legitimately surprised as... Uh, I felt sunshine and warmth, and it reminded me of all those poetic columns that I wrote 25 years ago about how this time of year feels different when you're still living in cold places and the television is that bright. Like, that's used, that used to be what Florida represented to people. <laughs> the, the University of Miami's baseball team has started their season with 18 consecutive home games because it is snowing <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> You, if you were to come in here, Mike, you would see what I'm talking about. Everything else has sports television on it, but it's a duller color than what is vibrant and lively coming by my television, which broadcasts to the nation, ah, oh, the boys are in the warmth and they're almost back as you're still covering up because it's still cold where you are. Can you guys tell me what was happening in Minnesota the other day? Because I saw that the, the daily temperatures were going from like 10 to 65, like yo, yo-yoing around. Yeah, I think Chicago was 70 degrees one day and then 14 degrees the next. No, but I think this happened same day. I think the high, the difference between high-low one day in Minnesota last, last week was ridiculous. We live this life, though. I leave my house, it's 58, and I get to work at 76. Yeah. Like it's a hard life Wait out here. I put a sweater Wait on. A little I different. I don't Good need year. a sweater anymore. It's a anymore. little different. This is the coldest winter we have had down here in probably ten years. I'm guessing, and it's only because for a month it's been 55 some days, and then it gets to 73. It's hard out here. 
I gotta take my sweater off. Today in Minnesota, there's a low of 15 degrees and a high of 48. So that's, you know, a 30 degree sweater. All right, let me put it on the poll here for the rest. There, a lot of the country is still very cold. At Lebetard Show, do you feel any warmth? I really thought this part of me was dead. Do you feel any warmth when the boys arrive for spring training and you see sunshine on your Florida television? The Marlins and Cardinals were playing their first spring training the other day, and the Cardinals announcers were the ones broadcasting it, and they apologized to the viewing audience in St. Louis for how beautiful it was outside in Florida in being only 73 degrees. Apologizing to their viewing audience. It's consensus the best preseason, right? Like, not even close, yeah. no other preseason. It's it's just something about it. Like, I'll lose interest a month and a half in, but for this, like, when I see spring baseball, I just love it. I love putting it on, little background TV. It's so good. The best preseason by far. Roy's like, hockey. Hockey's definitely the best. I, I, no, I, I agree with you. It's oh, baseball. Okay. Good. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> thank, thank you for just assuming. It's pretty myopic. We have sold out uh, European soccer clubs coming to the U.S. on tour all the time, selling nah. out the big house. Yeah. I mean, if you want to go just from a revenue perspective, it's very clearly European soccer. There's no heart in that. I want to get to these grades in a second because we really do see the dirty workplaces of people. This was a funny story yesterday. The gossip where you get to, if, if I simply said to you, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to demand that for one day, everyone who plays football has to sit in front of a camera and tell me the truth about how they feel about their workplace. Like, how do you really feel about everything? Are we it, doing grades here? It, no. Well, I'm, I'm going to wait for a second to do it because there's something else I want to do. But uh, I want people to know that we are going to do it because we really got to sniff around in the laundry room and the underpants of the NFL yesterday by finding out, hey, how do the players really feel about the training staff, the food, how they live, how they're treated as human beings, the weight room, to see, to see the Dolphins – Get the best grades all around everywhere. Straight A's means that Stephen Ross is indeed great about te treating his employees well at the front of a franchise that has made him a lot of money, has made him a conqueror. Has ha He has made – Stephen Ross has been, by results, a truly terrible owner. Truly terrible. One of the worst in the history of this market. You could say worse than Jeffrey Loria if you want to say, well, at least Loria won a championship. Stephen Ross got straight A's yesterday on how he treats the employees in his business. He was voted the best of all of the owners. There is none better than him. But the owner of the Chiefs, Clark Hunt. Clunt? No? Could have been. Added the L in there. Why'd you add an L? You're scared with that There's precedent for adding the L. Terrified. Okay. Careful. Gen Z would have said it. Mm. That was such a good joke without the L. There's precedent. Yeah. Australians use it. Clark Hunt got. Yeah. Supercharged that, man. Well, then it's Atta not boy. good after you do that. I felt my coach was disappointed in me, so I was like, I got to go back in. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, I mean. I give him an A for that What's one. What's your grade on that? Thing? We're not live. It's fine. You were. You were. You were, you were surprised that Stephen Ross uh, scored so highly. I think Stephen Ross, I'm not a Dolphins fan at all, but just as a neutral, I think Stephen Ross is incredible. I, mean, I understand that he has one pretty huge scandal with Brian Flores out there. But trying to get but Brady? The scandal at, at the heart of it was he was trying to get the greatest quarterback of all time who, who went on to win a Super Bowl. I, what he's done in the facilities, uh, what he's done to as someone that has been working in media for 18 years and has seen the sea change from Huizinga and the Parcells era of how they treated the media to Stephen Ross, it, it's much more first class than it ever was back then. I think Stephen Ross has been a tremendous owner. Okay, well, let me explain some of the history to people of how money gets gets passed down in towns to make men uh, wealthy, real estate tycoons. We've only had a handful of them down here. Mickey Arison has owned one of the franchises, but this franchise, that stadium, that ground, bankrupted Joe Robbie's family. Joe Robbie built that stadium, used some of it, was dumb enough to use some of his own money, bankrupts his family. Heisenga comes in and becomes local rich guy who takes over and wins a championship in baseball and 
wanted to buy the Heat. He wanted to buy all the sports teams. Wanted to, wanted to be what Stephen Ross is now. Wanted to build a Disney World around that whole area of, of the land that Stephen Ross now gets for F1 and other things. Instead, he just bought a Supreme Court judge. That's right. That story's amazing. I did not know. How? That's on my watch that I don't know that Wayne Huizenga, local sports owner, has bought Clarence Thomas. And to, I'm the, to be I'm, fair, it's on all our watches. I mean, mm, but yeah. on, I was the journalist in town as he built all of Fort Lauderdale out with money. Yeah, yeah I saw I saw Huizenga's face in the graphic that John Oliver was doing on that story. I was so like, hey, hey. It was amazing to watch that. The He's whole thing. Dead, so we can't say much. But so Huizenga makes a lot of money. Like Kobe. And, and does some winning. Tries to get the best coaches, gets Jimmy Johnson, eventually fails at football, and now they've desecrated what Don Shula and Dan Marino built. And all Stephen Ross has done since then, product on the field, is lose and be irrelevant and give back all of the collateral that the Dolphins gave him and this town before the Heat arrived and before the Marlins arrived. He's done nothing but losing. He's been a and create probably the greatest sporting facility in the history of our planet. No, so but the reason that I want to bring this part up is because using his own money. The reason I want to bring this part up is there is next to no correlation between how good your ownership is and what the results end up being on the field. You may think Bob Kraft is better at this than others, but the two-time champions are run by F-minus Clark Hunt. I'm scared. F-minus, I didn't know was a grade. Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebitard Show. Did you know F-minus was a grade? I thought, well. I thought F was the worst that you can do. If A minus is a grade, why wouldn't F minus be a grade? It was Dan I'm like Dan. I knew there was an F plus. I didn't know about the. I minus. had never seen an F minus before. You didn't see me in geometry. In calculations of any kind. Now you get a participation trophy. Put it out. Put it on the poll, Juju. Did you know there was an F minus? Forgive my ignorance for not knowing that. But uh, my my overall point was I remember how much criticism Hyzenga and the Robbies got because they could never win after the Dolphins became used to winning. Stephen Ross, how do you do the calculations? Mike, you're just here to say that it has nothing to do with sports results. You're here, you're here to no, say— No, the results matter. No, he cares, and he's made, my, he's made my facility great, my experience great, and he treats the employees well. Isn't that what you want from an owner? I, and you want them to do everything that they can to win, and sometimes that's at a detriment. Is he this middling owner that uh, works against the best interests of the franchise? Maybe. When you see the, the big scandal being a direct result of his involvement, you you can be held hostage by some of these owners at times. Look at how involved Jerry Jones is. But he is a multiple-time champion in that sport, and he and the thing maybe holding them back at this point is his direct involvement. I, I do think that there are some lucky aspects. What's going on with the Hunt family? They, they lucked into Patrick Mahomes. Teams passed on, on that quarterback, and they're going to be perennially – important as long as that guy is playing but I do think ownership matters I think we've seen it down here with the the Miami Heat I think Mickey Arison even though I'd like him to spend a hell of a lot more has a proven formula yeah. of success I do think ownership matters if the shoe is on the other foot and he did everything oh, this great game. yeah thank you if if he did everything great on the field but then treated everybody like and, and the facilities were terrible, we'd still say the same thing, right? Oh, wait a minute. You think that before yesterday, everyone in the country knew that the Chiefs are run like shit? That the two-time champions are treated like I you hadn't heard that recently. Like, I had not heard I don't hear a whole – oh, hey, you know who got an A-plus? Andy Reid for covering all that up because they love that dude. Uh, he gets an A-plus, but the Chiefs are shit. Like, the Chiefs employees are like, hey – we feel pretty disposable here. Like they, in fact, can you guys find? They're not hugely wealthy, right? A lot of these, I, I, I'd be curious to see. I think a lot of these legacy ownership groups that have had the the teams down by their families, like their main source of revenue is the sporting team, and they often get hit with that. Uh, the the Bulls and White Sox ownership group always notoriously accused of being cheap because uh, that's the main source of revenue for the family. Yeah, Clark Hunt isn't very wealthy. He's only worth two billion dollars. Uh, if I may, guys, I saw this. He, on he is kind of like a minnow. Is that though, asset or liquid, in that though? room? That's the question. Uh, you, you say this, but uh, I find this part interesting because 
we really got to sniff the underpants of the NFL yesterday. Like, this is how the employees feel about the people they work with, how they're in charge, how they're treated as humans by the organization. Like, there are a lot of reasons this story is interesting. But I also saw that Clark Hunt at the Chiefs facility, and I need your help with this because on the way in, I wasn't able to get this edited to make sure that I have it right. I saw a video of Clark Hunt's suite at Arrowhead Stadium, and it's six bedrooms. It's th it's a home. It's not a suite. He's got the, – the man lives inside. A, he, he has a home inside of the stadium that acts as his suite, and I was trying to verify if it was real or not, and we ran out of time before we started. Here. I don't know how much space that stadium has. If that is indeed the case – I wish he would give some of that up because as someone that has done the hospitality lounge at Arrowhead, I can't believe that that's actually hosting World Cup games in 2026. It is such a dated facility. Your your legs are in your chest the way that it would be at the old Yankee Stadium. It was just built when people were smaller. Except for this luscious he's apartment. Got, he's got two stories? It's, it's three, three stories. What? It's three story. No, he's got a home. A fireplace? Inside. I it's, didn't even know that stadium was capable of that. Uh, but it's real? All of that is real? I mean, because this looks real. Uh, it, it, yes, and I continue to wonder... Uh, when I go ever, whenever I go anywhere in the internet, I'm like, this can't be real. How is this real? And if it's real, how does not everyone know about it? Why? How is it that I'm just now learning that the super? This is a, you would agree with me, right? Winning cures all, Dan. Okay, but wait a minute. You guys would agree with me. Pretty well covered sport. Yes. Kansas City, we all remember pandemic. Football's going to save the country. They boo unity in Kansas City. Remember that. Boonity. Yeah. They booed you. I mean, you certainly remembered it. And then they win a couple of championships because Mahomes solves all and Kaepernick, all that stuff. Mahomes says, stop that. And then they stop it. And at the center of the spectacle of a sport that's covered very well, you guys are telling me that, like me, you're learning yesterday that the Chiefs are run like and that their owner's a baller who's got a home in the stadium? Like, uh, you guys well, knew that? Uh, well, no. And to be fair, I don't think we know that now. We All we have is this one data That's point. That's right. We also have a Nesson article from 2014 about yeah. the multiple living rooms inside this home that's been built inside the stadium. And by the way, I was wrong about the $2 billion. It says the Hunts, as a family, they're worth $15 billion. This article can't please you. You're ripping Stephen Ross for getting straight A's. No. You're ripping the Chiefs for Here. getting bad grades. Okay, like, thank what you. does this all mean? Okay, Who's going to see? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate this. We'll get to the gossip in a, se in a second. F minus coach. You guys got the F minus coach? Did you see the F minus coach? No. The Hunt family is actually super lucky. He's no longer a coach. The Hunt family is super lucky, not just because they have this quarterback head coach tandem, which you, you can't strip away their, their hand in that, but they're a border town. There's two different Kansas cities. When it comes to publicly financing their next stadium, they get to pit one state against another. Ooh. They hit the jackpot. That is correct. And uh, in the middle of all of this gossip, uh, Josh McDaniels was the worst coach in the NFL last year. F minus. Players really, really hated him. Man, they could turn this into a reality show. Just sit these guys down and talk honestly about your employers. Tell us why you're giving those grades. What do you mean the Tampa Bay Bucks are rooming together on the road? And paying for it. What do you mean? No, if you want a, a room a for yourself, if you if you want a room for yourself, you got to pay a couple thousand dollars. Otherwise, you got a room with somebody. What? This is a multi billion dollar organ. What? Get an extra <laughs> what hotel are you room. What are you doing? We don't room with people when we go on the road. What are you doing? You're the NFL. We got, can you imagine if I said you needed Mike, the Bucks to know that the Glazers were bad at owning? No, but I didn't know this. Did you know this? You're going to pretend you knew this. Oh, your American minds. It's cute sometimes. All right. I'm going to I'm going to make it so that Stu Gatz and Tony have to room on the road together. Perfect. <laughs> He'd love that. He'd love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Stu Gatz. Six inside. I w I would say if if you're particular if you're from Miami, I would love Stephen Ross just for the shade at the stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever go to a Sunday ball game at that stadium? So, dude, game changer. My skin would bubble. <laughs> I, th I think it's the reason I currently have skin issues. It's because of going to all those games on Sunday afternoons. Uh, issues. Right. Can I? Can I just? Uh, so, thank you for correcting me, Chris. Because yes, you are. You are right. 
that I might sound a bit conflicted here, but here's where I am not. Because I've seen the history of sports in this town, and I've just heard so many years that the problems with the Dolphins begin because of the leadership at the top. Like, I'm just saying, that, though, your perception of Stephen Ross, I hear way more of what me and Mike say I, about I, him. Understood. And so I'm telling you is that I'm coming from an antiquated time with what I heard the criticism of the Robbies, Heizengas, and everyone be. Whenever it is there was an absence of leadership in the organization, it always rose above the coach's fault. It wasn't the front office's fault. You lose for 10 years, 20 years, Shula's legacy, it's because you've got a rotting organization. You're not Bob Kraft. You don't know how to run your place. Yes, Stephen Ross locally has a very popular reputation because of all the reasons you mentioned. But I am with David Sampson when David Sampson says, well, the results haven't been anything, and it used to be that fans didn't care how we were treating the employees. As long as we got the results, Ross has gotten no results. They're going to pay Tua now. He's going to be one of the highest paid I players mean, in the league. No one squeezed more out of a single title outside of maybe Paul Pierce than David Sampson. Okay. Okay. Regardless, okay. Uh, I'm still telling you what – I'm, what I'm telling you is so, right? I, I can call him – I can call him one of the least popular owners in the history of South Florida sports because of the results and then have this report card thrown in my face and you would say, no, he's a good owner. Yeah, I think if you poll South Florida sports fans, they'll just say that because people tend to conflate on-field success with uh, how good their owner is. I think that's ingrained in, in fandom, especially in the social media age. It's just from where I'm looking, where I can disassociate myself from the emotion of on-field results. As just a South Florida sports fan, I think he's done an amazing job from where things were, from dealing with that uh, front office and, and, and group to attending sporting events at that stadium. I, I don't think... It, what he's done with that stadium is revolutionary. There isn't a place like that on the planet. I think he's been incredible. Steven, and to do it with largely his own money, too, what else do you want? Also, Stephen Ross, uh, I should tell everybody in the audience, as graded by his employees, his rating here wasn't just best in the sport. It was near perfect. They're, they, they're, they're asking their employees questions, and the rating is near perfect have, for their owner. You have Formula One, uh, World Class Tennis. This summer, you're going to have the Copa America Final. You're going to have wow. six to seven World Cup games in 2026. The guy's killing it. Killing it. And has it changed your perception in the last week? Do you think of Stephen Ross any differently seeing this? I uh, what I would say to you is that if you treat your employees well, if you if if in that league, which makes so much money, and still finds a way to be Clark Hunt, where you're not distributing it among the people who are working with you, so that the players are noticing how small their seats are when they're the big people and the staff is up front. Like, they're noticing, why is staff in first class? We're the economy. We're the two-time Super Bowl champions. Why, why don't we get more of this guaranteed? I see from that perspective how it is that anyone in that sport who climbs to the top of ownership and is viewed as seeing the players and treating employees most humanely, then yes, I would have to alter my opinion on how it is that I look at him. That's a massive achievement. Bishop the Rook Nine. To change an over 50-year-old man's mind in this country. (laughs) You do not take that for granted. Ever. Anytime you get a man of that age to admit he was wrong about something. Wow. You can move mountains, my friend. What you can em- move mountains. What if employees at Middle Lock Media get a similar survey? What do you think would happen? Let's all do. Let's do lunch right now. I'm going B plus. I'm going A plus. Yeah, you, you know, what? too healthy at times, but what? too healthy. You know what? Wait a minute. Let's do this. I would really like to actually do this because that we should have. We should make that a segment. The, the anonymity protects you. Very important anonymity. Yeah. Are yeah. you sure? And outside, like, well, boss, <laughs> with this survey that you've given me. I as you look me in the eyes, truthfully tell you that you're about you know, you know, incomplete grade for me oh, wow. personally. Mm. It's incomplete. I, I, I was still on a vision. I give early. you a, and I'm still here. A plus. <laughs> well, okay. I'd I'd like to do this honestly. If I'm calling for the NFL to do the, hey, can we sniff your underpants and find out how the employees really feel about the about the bosses? Uh, I think we got to figure out a way to do that. I think we got to figure out a way to do that. And the other thing I wanted to do. We'll have awful announcing reach out. We're ready. We have to. Independent. 
Uh, Chris Cody's not feeling confident about the montage he put together in service of Richard Lewis and our memory involved uh, with the show. He's worried about how long it is. And Well, how long is it? Right now it's at 14 minutes. Roy's combing through it, but uh, I, I think it's, I mean, it's just so many funny moments with him. It was hard minutes. for me to cut stuff. 14 minutes. Yeah. No, it's your show, pal. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to get to, and I don't know that there's something I miss more from anything that we've done in the last 20 years than the ability for our audience to creatively compete against each other to make fun of me. And they do it by text. And now when I'm in a wrestling costume, they have given me an assortment of wrestling names that what my wrestler would be named because yesterday I was in a Nacho Libre costume. So... You guys tell me from among this list of names which you like the best for my character, my wrestling character. Cold Stone Cream Austin. <laughs> That's it. I mean, you leading We're off. The gates. Yeah. Entree the Giant. <laughs> I mean, these are stand-up triples. Good two-hole hitter. Really right there. good. Brutus the Barber Cheesecake. Mm, slap single. Hulk Hoagie. <laughs> That's a cleanup hitter? The ultimate warrior. That's Truck out looking. Thick flare. Single. Mm. Yeah. Single. Thick with two C's. Yeah, no, I got it. Triple H cups. Oh, oh no. Oh. Truck out swinging. Flan Sena. <laughs> I didn't even get that, so. Get hit with the pitch. Out. Instead of John Sena, Flan. N Flan. Yeah, no, I got the it. The custard, the yeah. Cuban. Okay. Got Way it. Mysterio, Filet Mysterio, Souffle Mysterio. Three, three up, three straight three down. outs. Three up, three down. Tetas Roja. <laughs> <laughs> it's just red tits. Yeah, yeah I, don't think like that one. I don't think that's derivative of an, of an actual wrestler. <laughs> El Aso Wipo. Mr. 305 pounds. Yeah, no, these are all strikeouts. All of them? What Came out of the gate strong. What about yeah. red tits? <laughs> that's great. No. It popped out. Anytime you say Teta, it's good. Razor Hamon. It's Spanish for ham. <laughs> ham ham is funny. Just the word the word ham. Hamon is, is too, I by mean, the way. And so even, Hamon is too. Even when funny. That, when you're doing that, you do miss Sugat's laughing even <laughs> even though he has no idea what you're saying. <laughs> I do miss that, of course. He's going to have a book published. He's getting the money in an advance from the book dealer, Random House, not a random house. It's a big publisher. He hasn't written it, and now money is coming in from our fans in, in ways that put him up atop bestseller lists. And he's still going with a ghostwriter in the age of AI. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. He should probably just have a book with blank pages in it, right? It was a pitch that we received. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it warms my heart. There he is. Oh, God. It's, if you can, if you can, Chris. I feel safe now. Chris, I will Familial. tell you, Chris, Chris, here's the future for you in this business. If you learn how to manipulate those sounds so it feels like his spirit is here supporting me with fake laughter, <laughs> uh, you will get a better me and you will get less of him. And that's how you will usher us into, re <laughs> into retirement. Yes, it'll be lovely. Uh, I want to remind people that the Kansas City Chiefs, with the <laughs> worst organization we found out yesterday, even though they're two-time champions, also, and this is underreported, had a bank robber fan who called himself Chiefsaholic. And uh, he became famous. He became a famous fan. So your two-time defending champion, more famous than ever because of Taylor Swift, have a bank robber fan who is now, uh, he's going to get like 50 years in jail. He's got to return $532,000 and a photo, an autographed Mahomes photo, which seems excessive. It seems cruel. <laughs> and then his attorney... His, I didn't think this was a real thing. You talk about AI, Mike. I thought this was a spoof. I thought I'm watching this on the courthouse steps with some trash in the background, and I'm thinking, no, this is funny or die. This is a comedy team. This isn't Chief Saholic actual attorney. From the beginning of this case, folks, the government has been blitzing, and Xavier's pocket was collapsing. But today, 
Xavier stepped into the pressure. He took responsibility for his actions. He stood up in court, humble and repentant, and admitted what he had done. Now, if I know anything about Xavier, and if the Chief's Kingdom knows anything about Chief Saholic, we know that he doesn't give up. We know that if he stumbled and he fell, he didn't let his knee touch the ground. And that's because he's capable of doing a great thing. And he knows that there's still hope. We still have a lot of work to do on his case, but Xavier wants everyone to know that he loves the Chief's Kingdom, he loves Kansas City, and he hopes that you'll rally to his support. Thank you and God bless. If I frame that differently and just told you that was The Daily Show, The Daily Show had hired a paid actor to do that. Uh, that's The Chiefs have a bank robber who's going to jail for a long time with the misery of, I used to be our most famous fan. And now it's that Taylor Swift. I used, to be, I used to get my entire identity as a Chiefs fan, and let me explain something to you. I'm a bank robber. I, ro I rob banks. I think it's to support a gambling habit. <laughs> I think it's, it is nice. It, is, it tickles me. His voice. For, how many of those do you have? If you've got a variety of them, you could tickle me for the rest of the show. You got to get better at it. That didn't seem like a real thing, did it? Did it seem? Did it, you're you're watching that and you think that that looks like a spoof? The hard R on Xavier threw me off. That was crazy. <laughs> Xavier, young Charlie Casterly over there, really <laughs> forcing that hard R. I find myself bemused by the fact that as much as we cover this sport and we cover the holy hell out of it, we have this going on at the top of that sport, and I can't engage you guys in a Tua conversation because what the Chiefs have figured out is uh, how to remain championship worthy when you have the best quarterback and you pay him correctly and you have him cheap at the beginning of the career. He develops a relationship with the coach. The coach gets an A-plus from the staff because he's making the entire thing run and Taylor Swift surrounds it and makes you the biggest thing in the biggest thing it's pretty amazing to learn as a journalist yesterday the chiefs are run like shit it's become fact we, we, don't, we don't have the data points we know that their building is super old and some people don't like but the i think of the Bengals that way i think of the Bengals. Yeah, again the same the same thing these franchises that have been handed down where the main revenue stream is the actual team, you'll run into that. Did this, you see the the notes on what the Bengals have to go through as far as their like shower and the toilet? No, they only look, have five working no, toilets, by the way. Tony, the Bengals. I didn't read yesterday's Bengals stuff. The one, the only one I knew. I'm not plugged into football this way. Maybe Peter King knew this stuff. Maybe I probably Mina and, and a bunch of others. I did not know this stuff. The 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 only organization in pro football in my modern age covering f that sport as it's gotten very wealthy known to be cheap was the Bengals they weren't trying to actually win they were just trying to keep the business afloat and they were cheap in a million different ways and it didn't feel like you were being playing in the NFL or at a top tier organization to be playing for the Bengals because they were doing it cheap while everybody was making money. I did not know that about the Kansas City Chiefs, our two-time champions. And I'm not sure if America knew it. I and I feel it's <laughs> it's it's not exactly journalism because it's just, you know, a bunch of players talking anonymously, just asking about their work conditions. But I appreciated the honesty. All of this just proves what we already knew. Quarterbacks are the most important. It doesn't matter what your training staff's like, yeah. your training room, your facilities, how your owner treats you. Yeah, if you have a good quarterback, you win. And if you don't, like the Dolphins, A's everywhere. What does it get us? Nothing. Yeah, no. uh, from Cincinnati, from the actual report cards, this is under Cincinnati's tab. Um, the players reported that half of the showers in their locker room don't function properly, lacking either warm water or sufficient water pressure. They also mention a persistent plumbing issue, leaving them with only five functioning toilets for the entire team. Last year, the Bengals didn't provide three meals a day for their players. This year, they do, but only on Wednesdays. I'm just looking at this whole report card graphic for the first time. Green Bay's number three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm calling into question all of this. Tony, how are our grades coming along? Our grades, uh, 
working on them. All right, let me find out what's happening here. Are we doing lunch? What are, what are the categories? Can I at least get some categories from you guys if you're grading your work environment? What are some of the – I mean, because they got training staff. They got cafeteria. They've we got, got vibes. Vibes? Vibes are important here. I'm, I'm working with the video team. I'm putting together our report card. It should be coming up soon. We're putting the final, you know, the final touches right, on it. You're working on anonymity. It. We've got only a couple left. We should be Dan, getting don't pressure it very, very quickly. Dan, it right. takes a little way, bit to careful. build a graphic. Be I careful mean, because you're obviously a part of the graphic. And we, yeah, we you, don't make wanna, sure you don't want to be I don't want to change the grade on you. That's putting it together. I don't Someone's grade just went down. All right. Uh, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, of before? I, I want to get to the grades, and we will, because I, I think it, there's some funny stuff here. But when you hear the reports that Caleb Williams was paid uh, $10 million for the last two years, NIL and endorsements, and they got him cheap, by the way. Like That's, that's about the going rate for a starting quarterback, and it's not going to stay that cheap very long. For it's that. not just NIL. It's NIL plus other endorsements because yes. NIL's afforded this path. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I, uh, but, so, but when I tell you, so $10 million over the last cu a couple of years, I, just, I ask this question sincerely. How does Reggie Bush feel about that? Oh, at that school? Yeah. He Accurate. must be infuriated. I mean, they That's took strange. his Heisman. Give him the Heisman back at least. They took yeah. his Heisman. <laughs> the other question I wanted to ask you was about Tyreek Hill and um, paternity suits. And just it seems like in the last year of uh, Tyreek Hill's life, there's just a lot of volatility. It seems that that life is a, a bit uh, explosive. There are a lot of things happening around Tyreek Hill that you're not reading about happening around all of the players in the league. Here's a tweet from Black Sports Online. In the last 12 months, Tyreek had three babies, got married, got divorced, stayed married. His house almost burned down. He almost had a 2,000-yard season, and he's presently being sued by Thick Milk for breaking her leg for tackling her in his backyard. I, for one, am shocked that Tyreek Hill has volatility going on. In I his know. Life. I, well, but no, okay. It cannot be shocking and still be a lot. It can still, it, seven children and four paternity suits. And, you know, they just, we just got done with hard knocks showing us the inside look of this interesting team that's getting all A pluses. It's getting all A pluses everywhere, even though all it's done is lose for two decades because they got a couple of new guys. Well, I will say these scandals, if you could even call them that. I mean, it, it shows a marked improvement on the man's character. I just, my response to everything Tyree Kill, it doesn't work on a podcast. I'm just shaking my head. Let's all do it together. Okay. That's just it? A like lot of just, silence there, yeah. Oh, so. No, but like, they'll understand. People on the podcast, let's all do it. Just shh, for a second. Just. All right. Back it happened you. with me naturally because of that <laughs> idea. <laughs> Well, no, I. You know what? I'm with. It was Tyreek Hill. I'm telling you. I'm, you think no, it was me? I, it was Tyreek. I'm, I'm with Chris Cody on this one. <laughs> Us sort of shaking our head in shame, but not saying anything. But you know what we're saying. Exactly. It's just that's all. That's enough. That's all that needs to be said. But it. It's a. That's. <laughs> Dude, you liked it. Nothing more. It's enough perfect. said. It's perfect. I want an employee report card. I believe that uh, the listeners and the viewers of this show would enjoy. Uh, they'd even like to hear from uh, twice as many of you, I'm sure, about the inner workings of what it's like to work here. Because it looks like a hell of a lot of fun. Surely it isn't. Surely it isn't. Surely these people do not look this ragged because every day is a merry ride over rainbows. Tell me, tell me, Chris Cody, where are you on both our report cards and getting to these report cards for the commanders and for everybody else in the NFL? Well, if, if this was – I would I would forge the signature. I would not have my mom sign the, the report card. Wow. You, yeah, you guys ever have that when you were young? You get the report card, and then it didn't do so great, so it's like, I don't want my mom to see this, even though my mom always knew when they came out, so I could never actually do this. But I always wanted to be the kid that could forge my mom's signature. You forged your parents' signature? Oh, shut up. Everyone did. Oh, I forged my parents' signature, just never for a report card, because my grades were always pretty good. Dork. If you didn't, that's the more indictment. Like, every kid at some point forged their parents' signature. It was the progress report that really got me, because I wouldn't really get started until, like, halfway through the nine weeks. Like, four and a half weeks is when I would really start, all right, I got The Jimmy Butler right of now. education. Exactly. I was like, all right, I got these across the board, but I know I can take them to Bs and maybe a couple Cs. 
in the last four and a half weeks of the semester. The problem is that that progress report at four and a half weeks was damning. So there was times where I'd have to bite the bullet. And here's the difference, guys. And I'm going to tell you, young listeners, right now, I'm here to help you. Uncle Tony's here. So what you do is this. What you do is this. There's going to be one time. Dan, there's going to be one time that you got to bite the bullet. Let my boy cook. And give your parents the progress report without falsifying their name. Okay? Because you got to see the signature? Cause, cause, no. So they, no. Because you see the signature plenty when you're a kid. The thing is, you got to let them know, hey, didn't cut it this week, this, this nine weeks. Here you go. Just, just so you can see it. After that point, they'll put the fear of God in you. You'll kick it back up in the last nine weeks, in the last four and a half weeks of the nine weeks. But then f- going forward... You sign off all the signatures. Hey, look, I got D's, but that's not that's I'm I, 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 I'm I can, here I for I can get it. I'm, get I'm it here up. for uh, for Uncle Tony's. Listen up, young people. I've got, I got a, you. I've got yeah. a I've got a highly a grift for you. Yeah. Uh, Our uh, average forty five year old audience really appreciates that. <laughs> I'm I'm coming for the yeah. new generation, Dan, of the new well, generation kids, of the Levitar show. Kid I'm listen, helping them. Younger and smarter. Kid listening in your dad's car, right? Exactly. Nah, I've, Mike, I've been surprised recently. Still, We're still in the 20s somehow. I don't know how that is exactly, but uh, Tony helps there. Jeremy, you can't have a lower grade than B in your entire life of getting report cards, right? I got a C-plus for one quarter in right. calculus. And you cry? it oh. was devastating. <laughs> I still blame it for the reason that I, I didn't get into a particular college because what college name it? It was UF. I didn't get into UF, but I got in everywhere else I applied and it was a, a major gripe. Uh, I never on progress reports. I was like excited to bring those home because I was always like A's and B's, baby. Man, it was the most exciting thing. Totally different world I lived in. Oh, I, awesome. I did the Tiger Woods fist bump for a C plus. <laughs> Big dog. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm right there with you on the opposite side of that hand. If I had dog. less than an A, like I was genuinely upset. Yeah, uh, uh, Jeremy, your life has been an unbroken boulevard of green lights. That's exactly right. It's infuriating. Yep. Yeah, it's it's really uh, it comes up in therapy quite often actually. Because a lot of imposter syndrome. Because I'm like, how does how does this keep being so easy? I wasn't a great student, but my advice is have a parent die. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a load off. Uh, put it on the poll, please, I'm write Juju. That down. Uh, put it on the poll as, I, as my parents are in their 80s. Have a parent die. What a load off. Mike, that's brutal. Huge relief, though. She was feisty. <laughs> you did not want a bad progress report around her, let me tell you. Well, if you're going to have a parent die, have it the one that's more. Yeah. 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 Once my dad was left around, I was like, okay, sub. If your dad had died, you would have been screwed still. I ran away from home because I got a B. And it's the it's it's A B and my it was the only thing my dad that's ever, a good grade ever mentioned. Why are you running away for a B? No, because my father is the only it, Poppy the only <laughs> thing. Eh? Yeah, I was, you know, I was. It's a, a damn good grade. I was a senior in college. I would have ran. <laughs> I'd peacock. I ran home like the prodigal son. Oh, B. I had like a Q three one year where it was close to a three <laughs> I was like. Guess I'm Einstein Dude, now. My sweet spot. One time I got all B's and a C. I was like, "What? What a wow. king I am!" The worst academic experience I had was when I was in college and I got a B minus on one of my grades, and so it put me on academic probation for the honors college. Oh, okay. And so, uh, yeah, I almost didn't have an opportunity to be the team leader within the honors college. <laughs> Not gonna say anything. Uh, you guys shook, just shook out of me. Like I'm actually shaking out of my body something that you have, uh, tr- you have triggered a, a legitimate a childhood trauma. Not now, a, a legitimate childhood trauma, uh, because I'm just now re- remembering that my father, who was impossible to please, I was always getting straight A's, and I got a B, and it's the only time he commented on the report card at any time. I ran away from home in whatever it was, fourth (laughs) grade, fifth grade, and got to the end of, you know, a bus stop a couple of blocks away. And I'm like, well, I'm a kid. Now what do I do? (laughs) Like after, you know, after an hour, like I've run away, but I'm like, okay, I'm really hurt. And how much easier would have been had he just been dead? So put it on the poll. As I said, Juju, have a parent die. What a load off. At Levitard Show. Uh, how is this list looking? Who's put together the list of categories for uh, how we're doing around here as employers? Dano, I went around and uh, put together a list for all of our team. Uncle Tony did it. Yep. And uh, we came back with 
uh, a grading scale that I think you'd be proud of. I went to every employee, got it anonymously, clearly, and uh, did all the calculations. And we put them up here. Let's put them up on the screen for everybody. I'm going to read it for the podcast audience. <laughs> so treatment of families. We get an A here. We're yeah. a family. We, we love families yeah. around here. We're big family people. <laughs> Food yeah. and cafeteria. Valerie gets treated very well. Yes. <laughs> as all of our families do. Food and cafeteria. But not as well as Valerie. <laughs> A minus. I don't know why the minus there. I think uh, I think maybe Danny Benita said something about something. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Uh, Holadera, we got A plus. You know, you know how that goes, Danny. Yes. Uh, so that's just you guys. Uh, yeah. Tom Sh- Foolery. Yes, yeah. Tom. <laughs> Tom Fo- I should have put Tom Foolery, but I think Holadera was better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. It, it could be- this would have looked very different if we were still at the Clevelander, by the way. The whole yeah. list would have looked huge different. upgrade in facilities yeah, over here. Upgrade. Yep. Uh, can we do the Clevelander? Can we? Uh, after you this, don't want to yeah. do that. Yeah, after this, we could do it. Yeah. We do that. Uh, locker room. We Gun get an violence A. a plus, by the way. <laughs> locker room. We get an A. Look around here. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> uh, support. Uh, parking. C. I take the train, so I wasn't. I actually. Oh, first, I'm learning of it. What a good thing to learn there. Yeah, first, parking. I'm learning of it. C minus. We had to go kind of high up. Yeah. So people didn't really like the parking. Your experience situation. with parking is a little bit different because everyone else has to go up 12 more ramps. Yeah. And at the Clevelander, it was only four, right? And at Clevelander, yeah, Clevelander parking garage was worse. On the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Look, anyone that wants to complain about the parking sitch here, please take a moment to reflect on your Clevelander oh, well, but days. If, if, if I may for just a second, on uh, you guys do realize we're wildly overpopulated. Okay, I, I don't know if people know what's going on in South Florida right now, especially on the, on the beach, but they just run spring break out of here. Like now they're just being aggressively like tossing economies and people out because, no, no, we don't want too much. It's hundred dollar parking, and it's because we're so overcrowded with the rest of the co- the rest of the country fleeing down here. We're so overcrowded that uh, we live in a place that has no place that can build out anymore into stuff that's not marshland. So everything goes straight up. Everything goes straight up, and it's the least affordable housing market in America. Hialeah is like five, Ain't and the truth. everything's going straight up. And so we're going to be parking in the sky from elevators 60 floors up for the rest of our time in whatever this downtown is. Well, right now our report card says C. So there's obviously room for improvement. The second half of the nine weeks, we're bringing it back. Um, Let's put the report card back up. Uh, Support staff, A. I mean, what an incredible support staff we have around here, please. Thank you, Stu. Weight room. Weight room, A+. Plus. Yes. I mean, Dan, you know how I, I see you in there putting in work. Yeah. Wait a minute. We Iron all saw Temple. yesterday you put in that work. I have been putting in that work. Uh, uh, this is uh, funny uh, that you guys are looking at this here, though. This looks like you just went to Frankie and said, Frankie, your security, what should you get as a grade? And he, he said, A. Yeah. yeah Whoa. That's, that's how no, that worked. Yeah. No, no, he said A plus, and we were like, hmm. No, he's a C plus. Temper expectations. Whoa. He's a C plus. Whoa. C plus. He's, he's the last line of defense between people that are using that bathroom and the three rat finks that continually don't put the toilet Leave seat Leave the down. toilet seat up. I, there, I'm sorry this, about that. This is, uh, this keeps security happening. A, I'd give it a triple A plus. Team travel A, very nice across the board. Head coach D for Dan. Wait, I mean, this for is, Dan this though. D for Dan. D for Dan. It's a, this is a brutal thing. But you're also part of ownership, Dan. So, okay. so A, I you know what believe, the A and Dan stands for. I do believe it's a good score. Um, this, Pretty good across the board, if you, I'm going to be honest, Dan. I don't know. There's a lot of room for improvement on a couple of things, but we could do a kick-ass job. This is crushing to me. <laughs> Sorry. I want to run away right now and sit on a park bench for an hour like I did from my father because I brought home a D. A, <laughs> a D in coaching. For Dan, though. I feel like Mike's been coaching us for a while, though. Only well, your name was Alan. Yeah. Right now we got a bit of a <laughs> interim situation. <laughs> you got a Coach Jim Bates situation going on right now. What was the most interesting thing to you guys about those stupid grades? About the the fact Green Bay, Green Bay being third, that you're better off not having an owner in your yeah. upper echelon. A little communism there. Do we understand? We we just generally understand how you have to negotiate better terms so that your players, there are 53 bodies on the court, are on the on the field for your team, that when they travel, they should have their own room. They should all have their own room. Not if you're team building. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a reason that for it. That is true. I, I, I can be talked into it, provided that the room is nice. Jacksonville went from 28th to 5th because of one thing. They got rid of the rats. Big Mike, rat you want problem. a room on the next trip? Absolutely not. I'm way too bougie. And certainly not with you. 
Thanks. I think the single greatest professional honor that this show has ever gotten in terms of creating things for people that make them laugh or feel good. I believe a few comedy legends have interacted with our show in a way that was playful, fun, and forever memorable, uh, whether it be Alan Thicke or Bob Einstein uh, or Richard Lewis, where they graced us by interacting with our show and going along with the bit with us. Richard Lewis and our relationship was only as a show jostling with him, allowing him to be maximum Richard Lewis. And now, curb your enthusiasm at the end of its great run, and the season so far has been tremendous. I can't believe that Larry David could take the neuroses of his daily life and turn it into endless content that never runs out. His friendship with a comedy legend, Richard Lewis, doing that show at the end. Man, I saw an interview with Seinfeld and Larry David where uh, Larry, uh, Seinfeld was asked with Larry David, are you going to ever do an, a sitcom or anything like that again? He's like, no, hell no. For what? What? I did it already. To accomplish what? And Larry David's like, that's a great idea to ruin it all, to do, just to ruin it all. And then he made Curb Your Enthusiasm, which somehow – has aged with grace, even though the last trailer I saw before this season, all I saw them running around the golf course was, man, those guys look so old. They look so old. And Richard Lewis was dying. But he laughed until the end. Like, he's still out here making great comedy right before he passes. Uh, do you guys remember, Mike, do you remember how close we were to trying to do a remote from Bob Einstein from Bob Einstein's funeral because... Uh, because he was around our show so much and because he would have thought it funny? Yeah, I do know that. Uh, I don't necessarily think that there was a content play, but I know that uh, Allison, when she was here, uh, almost went to the funeral, and Richard Lewis was certainly born out of... Uh, I do miss the Celebrity Prognosticator segment because we got to know people over those longer runs, and someone like Richard Lewis probably wouldn't have entered our environment. We're not for that segment. That show has uh, given us two of our favorite guests ever they were older comedy legends and i think uh, uh part of the cool thing about our show is we introduced in some cases a younger audience to absolute titans of the game richard lewis is a legend bob einstein was a legend and to have them both in the same show and both pass while the show is still actively running i, I know is uh, considering the popularity of that show tough for a lot of people and if you uh, operate inside the venn diagram of a lot of people which is like our show and like curb your enthusiasm i'm sure that news hits you very hard and chris and roy uh edited what you're about to hear here in memory of richard lewis because they uh they remember almost the entirety of the relationship it was funny contentious and he would basically just uh, come on and get deeply insulted and scream at me <laughs> Hi, Richard. Hello, Richard. Da, 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 da. Oh. Hello, sir. Are you ready? Let's go. He's ready. Let's go. All right. He's well, ready. Let's like go. That. Let's go. Right ready? Three, two, one. Join. Da, 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 da. Oh, are we going now? How dare you embarrass me in front of your fans? Well, I'm trying to help what you. What happened to you? I'm You've changed. What do you mean what happened to us? I've never talked to you before in our lives. I've, I've streamed your show, and uh, you used to be a very a genuinely nice guy, and you turned into a bastard. Joined now by our friend and nemesis, the comedian Richard Lewis. He is I'm a, no nemesis to you. I'm only a nemesis to Wolverines. Thank you for making time for us, Richard. Are you just sitting there anxious? Stop giving me any of this crap. I don't believe a word you're saying. I'm sick of this nemesis crap. I'm sick of this fake, fake fight we have. You know that we used to be uh, lovers back in, uh, back in the day in Cuba. You were so gentle. I was not gentle, and I used to give you all the tips. We won so much money betting. You used to call me Olivia. What is this Olivia crap? You're like, don't, don't spread these rumors. In rumors. You know what I saw? The, uh, I was looking at the shows, the years I did with you. You have your fans who love you, and you're great. I, I'm a big fan of the whole show. You say, how was Richard? Did he suck? Mm -hmm. Was he any good? Mm -hmm. 
How does his teeth, are they yellow, are they white? What, what the? What, what, why judge me? You know, I've right. been doing this for 48 years. You were four years old when I did Carnegie Hall. You have some nerve. I used to live in Florida. I have friends call me every time I do your show. He's a piece of crap. Why does he put you down? I said, I don't know why he puts me down. I'm a big fan. I'm a big, I'm a sports fan. I'm a, I've been a comic my whole life. I devoted myself to the arts. I don't get it. Just tell me why you hate me so much. Richard, de <laughs> devoting yourself to the arts. Come on, Richard. Richard. All right, so that was a bit of a lie. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, uh, I don't mean to be narcissistic, but we're gonna we're probably going to blow up North Korea. But I, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, but Curb does start October 1st. <laughs> okay, okay, an interesting <laughs> juxtaposition. No, 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 no matter what. Okay, what I'm just right. telling you. Curb your enthusiasm looks like so much fun. Everything you guys are doing. Uh, thank you when for being. When do I talk? When do okay, I talk? Okay, go ahead. You go ahead. Go and ahead. Talk talk. Now. Go I'm ahead. on tour. Yeah, all right. I'm going to I'm New York, then Philly, then then um, then the L.A. and San Francisco, and uh, I mean I have I'm I'm wasting my time with you mocking me. Blunt talk. It's premiering this August on Stars. He recently attended Ringo Starr's 75th birthday party. Because Enough, I only have 400 seconds. You know, I'm fed up with all of you. Huh? What happened? Blunt Talk is going to be on Stars in August, and it's the greatest cast I've ever been with, and Sir Patrick Stewart is my client. I'm a psychiatrist. Sure, mock me. Well, you're, me. you're full of it. I mean, because you say every I'm time... I'm full of it. Yeah, because every mean? time you come on with us, you say something you're involved with is the greatest thing you've ever been involved with. No, that was just a hooker in Vegas. Okay. I'm just kidding. I never used never. hookers. Never. I've never had a hooker in my life. I, I'm just I'm kidding. It wasn't now. Vegas. I'm very happy, and, and I'm a, and I'm a hypochondriac, <laughs> and I used to put a like a Michelin condom over my body. All right. I know Larry David since I'm zero. I was I was a preemie, and I, was, I had to stay in a hospital for three days, and then he was born, and he tried to hang me by my umbilical cord, moron. And then I went to a sports camp, and I, he was there, and we were enemies. And then I never saw him again until we were comics and we were best friends. So one day we were going over our childhood and uh, when we were like 24 or so, and then we realized we were the same kids at 12 who hated each other at sports camp. It was a billion to one shot. It was pretty cool, man. I got to imagine that you and Larry David, that wasn't much of a sports camp, like in terms of general athleticism at 12 no, years no, old. No, wrong again. I was a great athlete, just too short for basketball but one of the great stickball hitters in Jersey and New York. In fact, I'm in a stickball, professional stickball league in L.A. And no, you, I no you're Pete not. Rose, I beat Pete Rose in stickball. So there you go. <laughs> you professional what? stickball? He calls me up and he says, let's go to dinner. And I go, what time? He goes, 4.01. I go, 4.01. <laughs> You know, he's a very wealthy man. I, I, I make a good living. I've been working my whole life. But, I, you know, he doesn't have to treat me. Screw him. <laughs> so I go to this fancy restaurant, Beverly Hills. I get there an hour early, okay? I go to, I go to the maitre d'. I go, here's my credit card. Oh, Mr. Lewis, no, Mr. David always pays. Me. No, screw Mr. David. I could pay for him. No, no, he'll yell at us. I don't, I don't let him yell at you, you babies. Yeah. I'm paying. Uh -huh. So I give my credit card. Larry comes a, an hour late. We were always broke for years when we started. And I said, Larry, why don't we just order what we used to do? I'd order chicken, you'd order beef, you'd get some soup, we'd split it. And he says, no, don't embarrass me. I go, what do I mean embarrass you? The chef will tell me what I want. The chef will tell you what you want? <laughs> what are you, nutcase? How do you, you changed on me? What kind of? So the chef brings out 20 dishes on one of these lazy Susans. 20 different entrees and we don't even speak for more than one minute he and the phone rings and he goes oh my god i forgot it's poker night at steve martin's house and he leaves me <laughs> you have to pay for it. he leaves me with 20 entrees and a 1200 dollar bill <laughs> You know, I love Einstein, too. He's, he's one of the funniest guys, but he's the loudest human being. It's like walking in where he's... You go to a restaurant. Let's say you go to a funeral, and you're walking to the casket. I swear to God. Yes. He'll say this. So, and I don't do a good impression. You go, two vaginas walk in, and they say hello to a testicle. And then the testicle turns around and makes a milkshake. 
But I'm saying he screams this out while we're looking at the dead body in the coffin. That's why he's the greatest. Who do you, who, no filter. Who's, no filter. Who's, I don't know why. And he's such a nutcase. But yeah, I love you him. all are, though. Who's the biggest? You're all nutcases. All of you. You're like, you're like Gandhi. You're a mental case. <laughs> and Ringo introduced me to my wife, so why don't you fight me? <laughs> Ringo, I, bite no, me. No, I'm calling BS on that. <laughs> Ringo on. didn't introduce you to your wife. A beetle did yeah, not yeah, introduce now, you to now my wife. tell me that Ringo's not one of my oldest friends for 30 years and introduced me to my wife and that, that, that and uh, Jordan's a huge fan of my stand-up. So, you know, I mean, why are you lying to your fans? <laughs> <laughs> and you're making me look like a schmuck. What did you just do to us here? We were just talking to you about the Knicks, and all of a sudden you told us a story about Michael Jordan sitting next to you that didn't have anything to do with anything. That's because I'm a hoax. I'm a, I'm a hoax as a comic, as a guest. As a husband, <laughs> but you, you, I, have, I have no sperm left. I can't have children. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Wow. It's, it's, it's all bad. I Let me it. say right now, I think this is the greatest interview you ever had. What do you think of that? <laughs> this is the best interview you had in two years, you clown. <laughs> this interview was the best you had in like five years, you moron. Yeah. Yeah, how come I did two Super Bowl commercials in the last five years? You know, bite me. Yeah, really. <laughs> I'm tired of your fans. Thinking I'm not good, I'm not funny, I don't care about you. You vote, I don't vote for your guests. What, what kind of crap is that? How was he? Was he any good? Was his hair any good? Is he losing? Is he, is he getting bald in the back? Screw you. Here, Screw you. Put it on the poll. Uh, was Richard Lewis any good this time at Levitard <laughs> Show? Was Rich, were, were Richard Lewis's teeth yellow? <laughs> Put that, put that on the poll as well. And even my wife, like my wife, was not a gigantic sports freak. She happens, to, she likes your show, and she says she heard me on the phone when she went, "You sucked." <laughs> Guillermo, put it on the poll. My is own wife, Richard my own Lewis's wife, hair put you ahead of me. Do you know the Ohio State fight song? You want to lead us to break on the I, Ohio State fight well, song? Well, no, it's okay. I, you know, uh, on Ohio, where's your deli? I need something. That I, it doesn't where's matter what the words deli? are. Where's your I, deli? I'm a graduate. I graduated Famous with a love BS in marketing. Yes. And then Wait when he has time to set up in the pocket, he really does have a, a, a shotgun. Wait a minute, you know, Nemesis. Do you know your quarterback's name? No, I, I don't. I don't. Names are unimportant. It's just a position, and I don't. How dare you quiz me on Ohio State like this and embarrass me? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm one of the most famous. Yeah, yeah, I know his name, Irving uh, Schlockowitz. <laughs> they probably got eleven guys who knew Walter White, and they played. You know. And they ran the offense with really? the first team. Really? Really? You're accusing your team of being on meth? No, no. I'm saying they hired people to make believe they were on meth to run the fast offense. Oh, that's Try to job. listen to me. That's much right. different. You're right. What was the best time, the single best time, the most fun time to be Richard Lewis? Sleeping with, uh, you know, with, with beautiful actresses. And when the Knicks and the Jets and the Mets won in 69. By the way, what's going to happen to the uh, the Patriots quarterback? Is he going to? I I I've been on the on the road. Is is he going to do the four game thing? No, uh, well, it's just a topic from two months ago. <laughs> oh, you see, that's what you guys care. You just care about ratings, and you don't care about ethics. That's right. Uh, and on that note, we're going to let you go. You know why? Because you hate me now. Yeah, if we cared about you ratings, you wouldn't be on with us, you, Richard. But I, Richard, I, I, I Richard worship you. if we cared about ratings, you wouldn't be on with us right now. Uh, that was the meanest yes, thing ever said your to book. me. <laughs> your book, you know, your book. My your... mother tried to push me back into the womb, and that's yeah. the exact yes. thing she told me. Yes. If I cared about ratings about our family, we yeah. wouldn't that's have it. I, I wish she had. <laughs> I, I, look, I apologize for all of this. You can edit it. You can. You, no, you don't we have can't to edit it. It's live. I, I was trying to be entertaining for you and for your, all the women in your life. In, in fairness to, uh, to Chris, it's really hard to capture the essence uh, of a Richard Lewis appearance by having it be bite-sized because nothing that he ever really did on our show was bite-sized. The meandering, the rambling, it was part of the bit with him. So that's why we honored him appropriately. Plus, I wanted to kill a full segment. Not nearly respectful enough to him, by the way. A legitimate legend. Our show was wildly Comedy disrespectful. Icon. That's all it was.
Like that's that, I'm telling you, there wasn't good. a lot of heartfelt. No, there was zero. No, no, no. We had a very superficial, <laughs> uh, was, shallow relationship with Richard Lewis. It did actually. And Roy cut out at the end. There was like, I love you guys. Same to you. But Roy cut that part out. <laughs> really, Roy? Yeah, cut for time. It needed yeah. to be a little bit shorter. Ten seconds long. Just trying to be yeah. efficient. Yeah. I'm happy yeah. we cut anything for time here. Why wouldn't you have made it with the I love yous? That, Dude, that, it was 14 minutes long before I touched that thing. I actually man. have another. And then it was 1330 after he touched it. I actually have another 40-second clip that I was like, this doesn't fit the montage, but it is funny. I'll turn the volume up on the. <laughs> By the way, Leonard Nimoy passed today. He was a buddy of mine, and it's very sad. He was a brilliant guy, and, a, and only matched. His acting was only matched by his class, so I, anyone who loved him, I, my condolences. But, Richard, what did you just do to our show? We were talking about sports, and then you talk about oh, your show. pardon me for mentioning someone who dies. You are a rude human being. <laughs> I'm with Lewis on this. No, no. Let me tell you what I don't <laughs> That's care That's our game? Oh, my God. Okay, you can't, can't, you can't cut that. that. Just, I can't that cut for time. time. He's the Lewis. What's going to happen? You better, come to my, you, you better come to my funeral. Okay. Oh, okay. You can see Richard and Kevin Pollack tonight, 8 p.m., our nemesis. Nice, nice segue, by the way. You're brilliant. <laughs> you know, I used to really worship you. I think now you're a complete idiot. <laughs> I am pretty sure I should let people know this part of it, I think. Uh, he didn't know anything about our show, and the joke was that this comedy legend was coming and being on this dumb Miami show for no good discernible reason. Just yeah, to pick Bengals six and a half. <laughs> When he knew nothing about football and was working in the gutter where well beneath where his talents had taken his life. Yeah. Did you see Larry David's statement that uh, he gave to HBO that has been circulated? Uh, here's a quote. Uh, Richard and I were born three days apart in the same hospital. And for most of my life, he's been like a brother to me. He had the rare combination of being the funniest person and also the sweetest. But today he made me sob. And for that, I'll never forgive him. It was well written. Like when I read it, I'm like uh, ending on a joke there because their friendship laughed until the end. Like, of course, that's the thing that would that's the one thing that would reach through all the neuroses of Larry David and reach him the mortality of losing a friend. When you saw in their on air chemistry that those two knew how to be friends. I'm telling you, though, you guys got distracted when you heard I'm with Lewis on this. You missed the part of this sound that I wanted to play for you. When I die, here's what's going to happen. Richard Lewis died. He was sure. a funny guy. What's with Whatever. the weather? That's what's going to happen. You better come to my you, you better come to my funeral. Okay. So we were invited, right. huh? So you agreed. Confirmation. When do you, when, when do you head out? You need oh, to give wow. him some vacation time. Okay. Where's, you should go tomorrow. You want to do the show out from out there? Sure. How, how heartfelt are your condolences? I don't want to do the show from out there. That's in poor taste. I'm with Lewis on this. <laughs> but we were invited. Well, Dan was. No, oh, it's okay. binding. Okay. okay. All right, it's binding. He said okay. Yeah, you did say okay. He meant it. As okay. you know, he was always super serious during his appearances here. But yeah, rest in peace, comedy legend and friend of the show, Richard Lewis. We can handle the show without you tomorrow, Dan. Like, if you need to go, we understand. Live report. If you want. I mean, a he had a great lid in his heyday, too. Yeah, we're just saying you should pay great respect. Great lid. I don't know how many people like I I don't know necessarily that we should be doing the entirety of the eulogy on behalf of what that man's career was but you're talking about 45 to 50 years in stand up comedy and I th I think people understand that uh, that's a career without a safety net, that those are artists that don't like have big employers with health care benefits and stuff. You can latch on to shows as a writer and stuff, but to be able to create the career that that guy created out of just his funny and his neuroses, because his whole bit was his whole bit was to be like publicly insecure like that, that in a way that crawled around in his skin. And and the show that he and uh, Larry David do together, like I he didn't he wasn't on from the very beginning was he was he on from the very beginning of that I mean, show? it was pretty apparent that even if you weren't a fan of richard lewis but maybe you like seinfeld like he was without saying it there and he, he kind of touched on it he was a muse for larry david he is one of the most influential voices in comedy and in that he influenced larry david so Richard Lewis's legacy probably doesn't get uh, the credit it deserves. I'm guessing that when Larry David composes himself to like give you his real thoughts on what it is that that brotherhood was, I will guess that he will be introspective enough to understand and grateful enough, even though he doesn't tend to give off very much joy or gratitude in his work, 
grateful enough to say, do you realize that I never ran out of material because me and Richard Lewis were always just walking around town? And so Richard Lewis would, I'm, I'm guessing that this is at the core of their friendship because I do wonder how they never ran out of material. It's because like, really, you can't serve breakfast after 11? That's a hard no on my eggs. If I'd been here at 1055, you could do it, but you don't have yeah. the technology to do it. I'm guessing that's just them televising yes. their friendship. Well, 100%. All of the Seinfeld stuff that works so well, and certainly Curb after that, where it just uh, picked up and, and ran with the ball, is all observational. And you could totally see how that's born with brunch between Larry David and Richard Lewis. And in some ways, right, because this is not, uh, Larry David doesn't give off anything but misery. Uh, the work is funny, but he gives off not a whole lot of happy. Do you realize that in the neuroses that him and that friend shared, the fact that it was an endless source of content is the only way he can go after Seinfeld and do another. I, like, nobody believes he's done. When his friends are dying, and these are the people who made him laugh. And Larry doesn't seem like a, like, he doesn't seem joyous, right? But he finds the funny in the dark uh, when your friends are dying all around you and you can't get through the season without losing Richard Lewis. And before that, Bob Einstein, who he loved similarly. Um, yeah, it's a bit of, it's a bit heartbreaking, but the season's been good, Mike. Like the art that they, the art that they're making. Through, through three shows when it's hard for comedy to age. Like, I'm hoping we view the rest of this with a gentle eye because it's hard to finish these things correctly. People have been hard on this season of Curb. <laughs> I've seen you know, memes putting Hakeem Olajuwon in a Raptors uniform, oh, no, equating no. it to this season. I don't, I don't think that's been the case. Like, if you're tired of the observational humor from, <laughs> from Curb, why are you even watching Curb? That's yeah. kind of a, the show's deal. It's built on that. Maybe it's leaning heavier than you're used to. Because I think in the last few seasons, Curb has had a singular thread and story arc carry it through the season. And I actually wasn't a huge fan of that. And in many respects, it's getting back to its roots. Can I ask you guys, as someone who just really can take some of the fun out of what I'm watching by just marveling at the construction of things, will anyone in the audience allow history and art to gracefully finish when you consider the degree of difficulty of writing 25 years of this is the most popular television and the standard is through the sky on what you're doing. If this gets worse, I'm going to notice. I'm waiting for you to get old. I'm waiting for it to get worse. I'm asking you. Are we still talking about Richard Lewis? I'm asking you sincerely about their careers at the end. I'm, well, I, I hope that we're afforded that opportunity uh, with a passionate fan base and, and leaning into <laughs> some of those personal relations that we built through over time because i mean we're approaching our 20th anniversary there's a lot of young bucks in the game right now with bigger platforms and you know we're trying to find our way and i think that uh, we can maybe draw inspiration for how larry david had this whole second chapter i'm making it about us you really did at the end well i thought you were talking about us yeah i wasn't though i was talking about the career of richard lewis hmm well, listen, Uncle Tony, you'll be fine. It sounded like you were, we're talking just about the reviews of Curb Your Enthusiasm for this season. So, I, I just haven't. That's not what I've been hearing. What I I'm taught when I'm talking to Amin, and I don't know what I, Jessica and Amin like the season. I think just it was Jessica like the season the way that I have. But I'm also telling you that I'm grading it through the curve of how d the degree of difficulty. And here I would be talking about us of trying to make something when people around you die. Like, or are sick, because the, what has been clear in watching Curb Your Enthusiasm for the last three years is that Richard Lewis is emaciated, like he's 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 sickly. Yeah, and that what was also clear is that he very much wanted to be a part of it as that was happening to him, because it was known, if you saw that most recent episode, you, you yeah, I mean, we kind of all probably said to our partner, like, uh, is looking, looking rough there. But um, I think that they found great joy in wanting to, to do that as his time was winding down and share that with his friend. It was, uh, you know, kind of a beautiful thing. We making this about us. They were making <laughs> jokes about the will while arguing over the golf cart. Yeah, that's like, the kind of morbid humor that I kind of love. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> By now, I'm assuming on a random Thursday in February, February 29th, I was told. Leap year. Yeah, I was told I didn't understand what you guys were doing with leap years and Halliburton where you were talking about I, I need to wish him a happy birthday. Hold on a second. Let me get that because, okay. 
and happy birthday to him. I don't care. Good luck. It's his sixth birthday, and I don't know why more people aren't talking about this in the NBA. They're talking about that, you know, that inflatable car man outside in San Antonio. No, a six-year-old all-star like Tyrese Halliburton. Scoring like that. Prodigy. Scoring like that. Same age as my daughter. Uh, leap year. I don't understand the math on that, so you guys will help me. He's just not actually six years old, but this is an extra day, and what are you doing with your extra he, day? Yeah, are there any good leap, leap year? Are there any good leap day, leap year jokes? Everyone's joke is, I wish we had it off, huh? We, we should. should be home sleeping today. No, we should. It's it's well, ridiculous. This is we, an extra day of labor. Where We're he, not being paid extra. I'm, more, I'm curious where he generally celebrates. Do you think he does the 28th or the 1st? Wow. Let's ask him. You guys, uh, you, okay, yeah. So you think every year he's confused about when it is that his birthday should be because the I would do the twenty eighth. No, it's probably just whatever calendar. has a better weekend, right? Like if That's it's true. If if I one mean, of we them all is do a that, Friday right? versus Thursday, yeah, exactly. So it's just whichever is closer to the weekend would be my imagination. Like if your guy's birthday falls on a Wednesday, we're going to dinner Wednesday night, or you guys wait until Friday. I mean, my my mm-hmm. wife's birthday is this weekend, mm-hmm. so I've planned us a day, or it's on Monday, so I've planned us a day for Saturday. Gonna do dinner on Ooh, her the actual pre, birthday, the pre, but it's gonna I be pre you. birthday over the weekend. Yeah, more convoluted than these things need to be. Me making things convoluted? Just the whole thing. Just no the way. Whole, just the whole thing. Unnecessary. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to play some sound here for the audience because uh, as we continue to roll out over the next couple of years, our partnership with Rachel Nichols, with Stephen Jackson, with Matt Barnes, and with all the smoke, with really, even though Mike Ryan, we can all get along, even though Mike Ryan is boycotting Paul Pierce, he is not a part of the uh, Ray Jean Rondo and the collective of people who were be like interacting in our worlds over the course of uh, the next couple of years. In fairness, I've made my feelings known. Our partners know where I stand, and I'll just recuse myself of any truth. Uh, okay. Fair enough. But regardless, we are in business with all the smoke. Uh, Steven Jackson did a South Beach session. It's the most vulnerable I've ever heard him, and I've interviewed him a lot over the years. That was really good. Uh, he, Not blowing smoke. That was really good, you and Steven Jackson. Uh, well, I he look, one of the things, you guys make fun of me of being the grief eater on South Beach sessions, but one of the things my brother encouraged me to do uh, and others who care about me encouraged to, have encouraged me to do is use that space to talk to uh, – to talk to men about hard things uh, that men don't talk about, like, oh, my God, you're crawling around on your hands and knees because people die around you, and the, the grief is interminable, and you don't function right after it, and so how are you supposed to just get on uh, with your life? Just talking Man, about— we did not jump on you for hard men because we love you, pal. And you got away too close. Yourself up to we got you. You got away with it. We didn't say anything. Okay. Thank you for allowing me that liberty. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for allowing me to age with grace. But here's one there of the things. Go. Here's one of the things about uh, aging with grace that I have not done very well. I've never the- heard a respectful AO before. I wanted to be respectful. Then. Somber. <laughs> hey yo, that was crazy. Yeah. Like did it while tapping his chest and pointing up to the sky. <laughs> No, it should have been it should have been prayerful. Thank you. What is it? Is it because it's the graveyard of my brother's feelings? It was and you close, have to yeah, be, it was yeah. close to that. So I wanted to make One sure of the things my brother told me A-O, before he A-O. went. A-O. Wait a minute. What is the, what, what is that? There was a little trump in that. What's he doing? It's what here? he said. He said a lot of things. It's hard to remember them all. The really? best things. Really? Talk about hard things with men. <laughs> hey, yo! <laughs> Don't lose a plot. Steven Jackson, let's go. Hard uh, guy, you opening yourself up. Uh, yeah, so I would urge everybody to, uh, to enjoy uh, many of the things that our content partners are creating. They've got a new interview. I did one recently with them on all the smoke. They asked me about Pat McAfee and I answered there and Pat McAfee was on all the smoke now and this has come out today and there are a lot of things that were said here but I don't know uh, the totality of what was said. They've told me that we have like seven or eight clips. I don't want to play all of those but I'd like to hear some of what he had to say. Dan Levitard about this, about athletes kind of coming in the space and not necessarily cutting the line. But He's talked some shit on me. Has he? Yeah. Oh, get him. That's our guy. Well, we love to get. Yeah, get when I saw you signed with him, I was certainly asking in, some questions. This guy debate. over here. <laughs> this guy over here. I think Ryan is his name or something. Ryan. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I thought you guys could have made it alone. 
Like I, I thought you guys. Oh had no! So talent. we're by ourselves. We partner with them to build out the fast channel. Love it. Okay. Yeah, so that's the idea. Yeah. And I like Dan. I got respect yeah. for Dan. I watched yeah. the deal that him and Skipper did with DraftKings, yeah. and that greatly affected my deal with FanDuel. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of respect. But a lot yeah. of these older sports media folks aren't the biggest fan of me, uh -huh. uh, and they've certainly made that known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had some. We've had. Well, you know what? You know why, right? Because a lot of them wanted to do what you're doing now on ESPN. Yeah, they weren't allowed to. Is what they, they weren't said. allowed to. You think I was allowed to though? Like that's the whole but, part but of it. But you had the. You had. I ain't gonna say bars. You had the confidence in yourself to be able to get it done without worrying about what other people are going to say. I think it didn't happen for them because they came in more like, well, I want to do this. You, you said, I'm doing this. Instead, I want to do this. That's, yeah, a, a, that's a, a big difference. Hey, I'm going to those suits too. Like, they do not like me. We talk. I fully support Pat McAfee. His story is amazing. His charisma is amazing. I'm sitting there watching guys, you know, I'm watching wrestling and I'm watching the center of WrestleMania. And I'm seeing the guy um, conquer sports and rush to the head of the line. I understand why he thinks that some old media uh, would not like what he is doing. But I am a full supporter of him taking over this uh, space in a way that's given a whole bunch of athletes. Man, Dwayne Wade's now in the podcast game. Shaquille O'Neal. Like, ev they've realized that. He's given these people permission because they're looking at the punter making all of the money, owning all this stuff, and and changing the game. Let me hear some more sound. I don't have anything bad to say about Pat McAfee. Let me hear some more sound. Except for that one I time. was honored and pumped to get the ass to come Thanks, on to this show. You, you know, like, I am a big fan. Thank so I, I can't wait to see what you guys do and keep Thank going. You. And Thank shout you. out to Meadowlark yeah. for seeing yeah. what everybody yeah, else is seeing Thank you. and giving you guys some real, like, a safety net to go yeah. get it because <laughs> it's awesome. And that's Thank basically you. what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what they did. You deserve it. Yeah. You guys Thank deserve you. it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With that being said, I think you wear tank tops. I think you start, you know. <laughs> Coming over? Put snake skins. skins. I was about to say yeah, some snake skins. Yeah, I'm, I'm with the boots. I can definitely see Jack with cool. some snake yeah, skins. Yeah, yeah, give me some more. Just Mike, a, Mike just a, had said he had his drug dealer outfit on with some snake skins. That'd be awesome. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Stack looks hilarious right now. I mean, you look phenomenal right now. What is this one time, Mike, that you speak of that I've talked about Pat Matthews? Well, I think, I think Pat... Um, has a very good memory, and I think he's motivated by doubt because I think his work ethic um, across a couple of different industries is pretty unparalleled. Uh, I do know of an awful announcing story that kind of seized on you being surprised that he hasn't made a bigger impact on college game day, and you never know what motivates people. Maybe that's at the heart of it. I think largely on the balance of things, we are very pro Pat McAfee for all the reasons. I do find it interesting that um, you were kind of labeled as old media, I guess, because you're just older. And I think part of the stuff that surprised me with the Simmons, Pat McAfee thing is Simmons all of a sudden became guy that was classified as old media. I'm like, really? A, a, a oh, but, digital uh, pioneer? No, no, but this is this is a, this is the thing, right? Because Matt, actually, I will tell you that at this dinner, look, man, at this dinner with Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson, these guys have done a lot of business in their lives, right? Like they, they got. They've got crews of people who protect the economies of 17 years in the league, the both of them, and they've built a brand. And McAfee's right when he says to them, you guys could have done this on your own, probably, if you can get some investors to put up a good no amount doubt. of money. And, and they're like, no, but we want to partner here. Like they, those guys, I've got a meaningful picture, to a, a meaningful picture my wife took of Steven Jackson, like holding my head and telling me that, He's got my back um, because I believe in what those guys are doing. I they think it showed in that clip. <laughs> I think it definitely showed in that clip because they were quick to to defend everything that was there and and why they partnered with us. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I think Pat is pretty incredible, and I think it's really difficult to keep that charisma and that appeal and drive shows like that. I think I think Pat's awesome. I, I understand why he's lumped in as new media because his roots are very – grassroots movement but he's taken it to the ESPN platform and we've kind of made new media versus old media and the guy that's new media has ESPN one as a platform yeah. it's just a little confusing to me how you become old media I guess by being a little bit older okay but yeah no but I but it's not just that though it's, yeah you have old media roots like you and were it's, a newspaper it's man. also journalism and journalism you know and whatever we represented at ESPN that he replaced like in in yeah, like that that stuff is interesting to me. It's one of the reasons I talk about the industry so much. But what I would tell you 
is I couldn't support J.J. Reddick more, or Shannon Sharp, or, or, or these people who are coming for the space because, of course, the athletes are going to come for the journalists and they're going to be better at competition and they're going to have more fame. And I welcome all of it into the space because there's plenty of money here for everybody, for everybody who gets into the content game and does it well for everybody to eat. But I also, I understand why I'm being lumped in with that um, because because the athlete, Draymond Green is talking to DeMar DeRozan now about not wanting to go to therapy. Draymond Green, who's going to do all of these things in this space with his brand and maybe make more money after his career than during it because he's realized, yeah, the athletes can play the new media game without any journalists. I can talk, Chris Paul can talk to, Paul, to, to Dwayne Wade and Chris Paul just give up a story. Yeah, I could have been in Miami. All I needed was the number. And that story's only existing there because of the access that those guys have. And they've all realized, wait a minute, the punter did it? But the punter's story is the ballsiest. He leaves his career at the height of that, builds it, builds it himself. Everyone says no to him. He does it his way, and he ends up with the FU power to say, I don't have bosses anymore. And he doesn't, because he doesn't. He's leasing to Pitaro, and he's leasing to Iger. And he doesn't need them, because in this age, if you have your own audience, these people need you. You do not need them. I think it surprises a lot of those top-line athletes, though. You have to have a certain work ethic. All the smoke has that work ethic. A lot of people just assume I can turn on the mics and dominate in this field, and you have to have the tenacity, the work ethic of a Pat McAfee, which I said earlier was pretty unparalleled. You don't really notice. You, you certainly notice when an athlete succeeds in building out a new media venture. You don't really talk about when a Duncan Robinson podcast goes away. And in this athlete-led media space, there's a lot of projects that just go away. And they don't go away because, in, in most cases, a person just has something else to keep them busy. They go away because they realize it's hard. Oh, but It's I, very difficult. But, tra you've got Travis Kelsey saying it's the hardest job in the world. Travis Kelsey. Uh, this is what I would tell you, though, about Pat McAfee. He got such a head start on everybody, on realizing what it is to build his own thing. But if all of these people think they can do that, double flips off a turnbuckle at WrestleMania? A million they, dollars in several different industries. Are you, like, are you kidding me? Like, no, you can't all just come into the space and, and chase down the punter. That's not going to happen. Those papers you hear banging on a desk or an old coach still out on the road, still following basketball teams around. And I insist, our job, we have a job here, shipping container. We have one job here today with our old, old friend, Stan Van Gundy, still huffing and puffing around the country, chasing, bouncing basketballs. It is to make him laugh. For the next 24 minutes or so, uh, we must make this human being laugh. Are you going to help me? Is the group going to help me on this? We are here, Dan. Yeah. I don't Woo! feel like you're here. I don't feel like you're with me, Woo! okay? Uh, we need to do this with Stan. Uh, you can't get so used to Stan Van Gundy making appearances here that you arrive, and he arrives, and you've got this kind of indifference on you. Look at you guys. Will you show some enthusiasm for Stan being here, please? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, Stan. Build. We stand, Stan. It used to be such a big deal when he came around here. Back when he was running franchises and not just talking about the games. You can only dial it up so much, man. Yeah. You okay, know, you guys are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Like, well, you got nothing. Laugh. If I'm just back here going, Woo, Stan. Yeah, I know. I mean, okay, so much. fine. Okay, now it's been revealed. Now you've shown people too much behind the curtain. We so were easy, is it, Mike? We were never enthusiastic when Stan Van Cundy came What's around my here. Motivation? It was always feigned enthusiasm. He'd always talk about his politics, his, his liberal politics. He is friends with my favorite step, state representative, Ana Eskamani. Oh, he's trying. Look, can you imagine what Stan's life has been recently? as he deeply cared about doing politics on the ground in Florida and all around him, he gets overrun by corruption and sewage. Dumber and dumber by the day. Some of it gun-wielding. <laughs> Woo! That is for sure. Honestly, it is nice to see you, at least for me. I want to talk politics with you because you have tried for the last 10 years, and before that, really, but you've tried to be a progressive, decent human being. And all around you, politics trample you. Forward 30. It, it's tough in this state. There's no question. And, and I think the, uh, 
the real challenge for progressives in this state is to not get beaten down in Florida and to keep showing up and keep trying to make a difference because you don't get a lot of positive reinforcement in terms of uh, electoral results. Do you get, uh, I will talk basketball with him in a second. It's been too long since I've seen him. It makes me happy to see your face. Uh, and I and I do, I have, like, I don't want to normalize what LeBron is doing, that we can go this far into the show without talking about the oldest dude in the league. Uh, they're coming back from 21 against a Clippers team that can win the championship, hitting seven threes and doing it at that age. It's just insane. Like, I don't, I, I, there, there's not a, really a precedent for it. So I want to talk to you about that part. But I, I am curious before we get started. So Mitch McConnell is now leaving. And, you know, I want to make jokes about he'll spend the next, you know, 4,000 years resting comfortably wherever it is that he rests. In a but, turtle shell. Uh, but, yeah, he's been like he, he has been a plague and, and yet somehow, somehow more reasonable than what's coming. <laughs> like it, so, somehow he has been an evil plague for decades but he's not okay with insurrections. No, but he was fine with subverting, you know, hundreds of years of precedent to not even bring Merrick Garland to a vote um, on the Supreme Court. He was fine with that, with stealing a seat on the Supreme Court. But you are right in that the one thing I think that we know about today's Republican Party is it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So if you didn't like Kevin McCarthy, great. It brought you Mike Johnson, who not only is far more regressive, but also far more incompetent. I mean, this guy's just a clown. Um, and then so from Mitch McConnell, who knows where we go, but you can just count on it being worse. That's a good landing spot for Patty Mills. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we should do it. I should ask. Let's do it that way. I'll ask him one serious question, and you ask him what's a good landing spot for Patty Mills. Let it. Let's because we do need some basketball. I need an here. answer. What it, yeah. What is it? Well, good land. I don't know. I don't know what Patty's got left in the tank. I haven't seen him this year. Well, he um, just got released by the Hawks, and I know he's not going to buy into the de uh, team defensive concept of Eric Spolstra, but I kind of want to stash him just to keep him away from the other teams yeah, in the East right. because you know if he goes to one of those other contenders, oh, God, he's going to kill Miami. Well, the one thing with uh, Patty Mills is, you know, he's going to come in firing and he's going to light it up and he'll give you an effort defensively. I'm not so sure that he wouldn't fit with Miami. He's certainly not going to be a great defender, um, but he'll give you an effort. He's not like I mean, a what guy. are we doing? What are we doing? That's a thoughtful answer. He'll he's try. averaging 2.7 points point per Patty game. Mills oh, yeah, it's all about fit. I mean, he, he he's of an expert. He breathes basketball. Then why'd you interrupt him? He he has his question was so we much better. Mm. But he hasn't watched Patty Mills. He's saying, what's he doing? Like, why are you asking me about Well, that? I haven't watched him because he hasn't played on what's uh, a very bad Atlanta team. So, Do you think Trey uh, Young's uh, social media reaction to his injury was a bit much considering it's just a pinky? Come on. Um, I didn't see his social media reaction. My he's holding up the pinky. Uh, oh, he's putting first Corinthians up there. I mean, it's a pinky. Oh, well, I think a biblical quotation for a, uh, for a basketball injury is a bit much. Yeah. So regardless of what the uh, quotation was, 30 <laughs> uh, Stan, no. uh, what LeBron did last night, it's the biggest comeback fourth quarter comeback of his career. That Clippers team is good. Paul George did not play. And, but that Clippers team has dominated LeBron's era of basketball over there. They beat up the Lakers every time they play. You have no precedent for what we're witnessing from him at this age, right? No, it's incredible. I mean, the guy's still averaging 25 points a game. You know, it's, it's the lowest scoring uh, season of his career, but, that alone is amazing that you can be averaging 25 in your 21st year and that's the lowest you've scored in, you know, forever. I mean, it, what he's doing is is incredible. I mean, the only huge drop off with LeBron is at the defensive end of the floor. And he's gone from being a defensive player of the year guy to being a guy if 
if you're on the other team, you target him now. Um, and, and and I'm not meaning to be negative on LeBron. That's the only drop off offensively. He's still as good as anybody in the league. Uh, you're actually just saying all you're doing is giving voice to the human aging process, right? Because when I watch LeBron play, he is still obviously very strong, but he is and cannot be as fast. And in order to play defense, you have to be able to move laterally. So you're you're saying he's a defensive liability that he's being targeted. Yeah, I, I mean, look, here's the thing, too. It's, it goes beyond just the lack of lateral quickness. I mean, at his age 21 years in the league like you've also he's carrying such a huge offensive load you got to find places to rest you know he's playing a lot of minutes and everything else he's not a hundred percent healthy he's got to get some time to rest and his rest is on the defensive end and usually look he's smart so he keeps himself out of bad situations for the large part and They've been able to find matchups where it's tough for people to target him. In the playoffs, it could become a little bit more of an issue. Um, but again, that's sort of nitpicking when you're talking about a guy LeBron's age and what he's getting done on the offensive end of the floor. Uh, Dan took a sports question unexpectedly, so I guess I have to follow the formula. Yeah, yeah, Should fun. I be concerned, as someone that is not a conservative, that there have been a lot of Republican leadership positions that have had changeover where – uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but most people within those parties would say these are voices of reason. Even Mitch McConnell during January 6 was looked to as a voice of reason when everything was going on. You have these people stepping aside and being replaced by more MAGA conservatives. How troubling is that for the election? Well, look, I think the whole thing is troubling in that we have had numerous people who have just foregone their previous principles and beliefs. He, and people I maybe didn't even believe, you know, agree with politically anyway, but they've just gone, foregone those beliefs and are just totally subservient to Donald Trump. I mean, the amazing lack of self-respect on the part of leaders, I, I, I shouldn't even use the word leaders, prominent people in that party is, is amazing. I mean, Elise Stefanik was a an intelligent, thoughtful conservative. She just gave it all up, said, you know what, I'm going to chase power. I'll do whatever Donald Trump wants. I'll back him on anything. I'll say the election results um, were fraudulent. I mean, it, it's, it's really amazing. I, I, you know, the control he has gained over supposedly intelligent people i want to ask another politics question sports i have to stick to sports we can i mean you always have to stick to sports Dan. although you can You're take a political sports. question and then i can back go back to, to yeah, right we butter. just kind of right. as you know, ask, go ahead and ask hoops. the sports question and then i'll go to a politics well, serpentine question. draft yeah uh tyrese halliburton turned six today being yeah. a leap day baby uh i've been hugely impressed with his offense i'm sure people have found holes in his game but in terms of natural scorers where do you rank him in the league the history of six-year-olds yeah, well, he's the best six-year-old ever, probably. Um, look, he, he's I, I love Tyrese Halliburton. You know, people have started to see more of him this year. But if you, you know, the last couple of years, he's averaged over 20 in the playoffs. He's been their second best player. Um, you know, he was better than James Harden was in the playoffs last year. Uh, look, this guy's just really, really good. He, one of the fastest guys in the league in the end and is a 40% three-point shooter who has adapted to being a full-time point guard better than anyone could have expected, doesn't turn the ball over. I thought he'd really struggle with that um, this year, uh, the playmaking part of it. He has not. He's not a great defender, but he has gotten better at that end. Um, yeah, he's one of the best young point guards in the league um, and certainly the best six-year-old. Uh, hold on a second, though. I want to ask a politics question. We've only got a minute left here. We'll go to a break after that. But did I see a gleam in Mike Ryan's eye that I rarely see, which is his hatred for Mello? Was there a Mello conversation that just burst out back there? 
I was saying, I think uh, over time, you know, Tyrese Halliburton can end up being considered a better scorer than Melo. And then Tony and I, because we both know ball, got into, well, yeah, I can see that he can work a little bit more on the low block. And he's like, yeah, Melo's mid-range game. But I'm like, also, as a defender, that's a shot that I want being taken. The Melo mid-ranger as opposed to whatever Ty- Tyrese Halliburton can come up with. Tyrese, so it's a spirited debate. He's got to work on his back-to-the-basket moves. I think he's very good getting into the lane. I think he's very good shooting. The thing is, Melo had that bully ball where he would take you down to the block, give you that one two spin and then hit you with a fadeaway that At was a great 34 percent clip okay maybe if only one day we can get a basketball expert to tell us what he thinks about uh what you guys are arguing about while the basketball expert is talking i'm right here dan you asked him you asked him about basketball and then he gave you the answer and while he was answering you you went to a basketball conversation i actually like that i actually like that i appreciate that all right uh, we're going to come back with more of it uh next all right, Stan, answer the question that they're asking right there. Mello or Halliburton, who you got for all time? Is Halliburton going to be, when it's done, a better scorer than Carmelo Anthony? No. What? What? He said so definitively. Is he going to be a better player than Mello was? Well, he's going to be more well-rounded, yeah. Um, but... But he's not going to be a better scorer, and neither one of Halliburton hasn't shown that he's any more willing to defend than than Carmelo was. Politics question? I can ask a politics question. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. I, he was a little uncomfortable there. Like he didn't want to. He didn't want to upset the Mellow stands. I think this is something here. He's not uncomfortable. Stan- well, I think Carmelo. No, quite honestly, I'm not uncomfortable. Carmelo is an underrated guy. I mean, that guy was as good a scorer as we've had in the league. I mean, he's there with Kevin Durant, any of those guys. He could score on anybody, and he was absolutely fabulous late in games. Like, he made a lot of clutch shots. He just, because he wasn't part of a lot of deep playoff runs, I don't think he got the recognition for that part of his game. Um but yeah, Carmelo was a, a damn good he, offense. He just player. hung on to like a previous era, maybe for a little too long, because if the game gravitated more towards the international game, where you could rightfully argue that Carmelo Anthony is the greatest U.S. men's international of all time, yeah, that's right. then we're now we're cooking with gas, Sam Van Gundy. Well, yeah, I don't know about that either, though. But um, but look, I have a lot of respect for Carmelo Anthony. I mean, he was. He was one of the few guys you're playing against him. If I was coaching against him late in the game, you've got to come double team him because you're getting into those last shot type situations. Carmelo was going to come through virtually all the time. I, I That guy was a great, great player. What about Shane Gillis Alexander? <laughs> come on. I knew I smelled wow. the mellow on you. I knew I smelled it from over here. Stan, let me ask you uh, – let me ask you about what's happening all around you, because you talk about it matter-of-factly, but as I've mentioned to the audience for years now, uh, you've been doing the work in your community. You've actually poured many, many hours into not wanting political power, just wanting to make sure things are fair and decent and not unreasonable. It seems to me that you're living in a vastly more unreasonable time now than you were even eight years ago when you started this. And I'm wondering from your perspective, like, how do you not feel hopeless and helpless? Well, I do a lot of times, I, I, to be quite honest. I mean, the last, the last go round 2022, we had, I thought, a lot of good local candidates for the state house and state senate in Florida, um, women candidates. Uh, we we hosted a fundraiser for them. We put a lot of money into the to the campaigns of those women. I thought they were outstanding. And and um, other than the previously mentioned Anna Eskamani, we couldn't get a win. Um, you know, and it's discouraging, especially when you're running against people that are just really bad not only bad representatives, but in in my opinion, just their values are bad and they don't care about people and to lose those elections, it's it's discouraging. It is. And um, 
But also on top of that, I would think you it it almost as exasperating that the conversation, it's not even just that you're that you're losing the fights or feel like you're losing the fights. It's also that the discourse keeps getting dumber, like uh, empirically, uh, nonsensically dumber. I mean, look, we're we're banning books. We pulled in Florida. We have two districts, at least that for review pulled the dictionary off bookshelves in schools like it's hard to get more ridiculous than what we're doing we're pulling classics off the bookshelves we're we're pulling dictionary i mean it's it's insanity and now we've got this social media law that's going to pass and quite honestly it's not just the republicans only seven democrats ended up voting against it uh I don't know what's going on, but this state in for someone like me anyway, is heading further and further away um, from the things I value all the time. And it, it is discouraging. And I wish I could say I see the end in sight, but I don't. You're right. It's getting worse, not better. Stan, who's the team that you're looking at that could be a dark horse? Obviously, there's a lot of great contenders now. There's a lot of young teams up in the top in the Western Conference. Who's the team that you look at and be like, that could, that team could be a problem come playoff time? Well, there's a lot of, of teams it could be, so I don't really know. I mean, the dark horse are the dark horses, I guess, would be the teams that would come from down in the standings. So last year, we had Miami get to the finals coming through the play-in. The Lakers came through the play-in to get to the Western Conference Finals. I mean, both of those teams and Golden State, I guess, could be considered dark horses at this point. Look, nothing really would surprise me in the West. You look at the first round, normally if you get a 1-8 or a 2-7 series, like those are going to be pretty big upsets. There, There's not one matchup that will come in the uh, – in the West in the first round, no result that I would consider uh, an upset. So I don't know who to even consider a dark horse out there. I mean, I, like you, you're Oklahoma City or Minnesota, two teams who have really made big jumps. And in the first round, you could be playing like teams like Golden State with Seth Curry and all of their you know, Steph Curry with all of their experience or the Lakers with LeBron and AD, that could be your first round opponent. I mean, it's it's crazy what's going on out there. Um, you know, you always worry about Miami in the East. Um, but look, Boston's so, so much better than everyone. Um, I If Boston does, this is one of the few years to me, if Boston doesn't win the championship, I'm going to be shocked. I mean, I just think they're light years better than everyone else. There it is. We've been wandering the earth, a dry, dry earth. It's looking for po- Look, I've been looking for politics. I've been looking for laughs. And then what do I get? Hot take. There it is. Stan Van Gundy giving it to you. Thank you, Stan. I've got a number of different questions here that I want to get to, though. Not all of them basketball related uh were you indignant about wendy's uh price surging because they canceled it they said they that the feedback was so bad that wendy's was gouging people i know you used to love your fast food here the wendy wendy's uh, is delicious enough that i might be willing to forsake certain principles including you gouge your customers in exchange for continuing to eat wendy's but i was pissed off at him about this yeah not so much with me whatever they charge i'll pay Okay, so there you go. So you your principles fall Abandoning in the face. Abandoning his principles. Yes. My <laughs> principles fall into, yeah. I love Wendy's burgers. Ah, uh, the Frosty, great. too. Yeah, they're they're huh? never frozen. No, I'm not a Frosty guy. No. What? what? You, wow. you get the fry into a Frosty Come and report back. I can, get better, I can get better ice cream than the Frosty. It's not. And their it's fries, not frosty. And their fries aren't that good. No. Wow. I love them. You are so wrong. No, I love you are so no. wrong. In fairness to no, Wendy's, that's offensive. In fairness to Wendy's, they did have to clear up. People thought because of the, the dynamic pricing thing, it meant it goes both ways, up and down. Wendy's clarified that said, no, the, sur- <laughs> the it's not surge pricing. It's a dynamic price board that's digital with rebates. 
you know, when you have a surplus. And also, at least they have the transparency in the age of inflation to say, yeah, we're, we're going to raise the prices, or at least that was assumed. They never actually said that. I'm defending Wendy. Wow. Okay, that's okay. Thank you for doing Defense that. Attorney Not Wemby, Wendy. Uh, that is right. Uh, but I want to uh, be offended on behalf of everybody. Like, Stan is an aficionado of fast food. For him to say that the Wendy's fry is no good, like, come on. You know what, Stan? It's not an elite fry. He's Let's not wrong. Stan, look, in comparison to Stan, other fries. Stan, listen, I say this. The they, they make a good burger, though. They make a good burger. A double stack? You kidding me? My God, yeah, no. make a good burger. Uh, Stan, let's look at this video together. You tell me you went viral again because this uh, this clip every once in a while during March Madness surges. And uh, uh, this was uh, what was this? Was this Fordham? Was this what was the end of it was this? Four game? years oh, ago. This was Furman, Furman in Virginia. All right, so it's Furman uh, three or four years ago. Let me see what we've got here. Oh no, okay. I thought you were talking about last year. No, this was last year's where they had the inexplicable turnover. Yeah, this is the Furman Virginia game. I feel like Harlan disrespected you there. He didn't trust you to stay out of the moment. No, well, I, Kevin does that a lot. Um, that's just, you know, he wants to he wants us to let the crowd uh, noise in. And it was a great moment, a great call by Kevin. First uh, March Madness game I had done. So we had four that day. That's the first one. Um, <laughs> that's the first and, one. Uh, it was my first one. And it was uh, it was incredible. And it's still amazing to me. That was a senior point guard who'd been part of a national championship team who just put the ball up for grabs. Um, it was incredible. It was, you know, I identify always with the pain of coaches more than the joy. And so while it was a great moment for Furman, I just really felt for Tony Bennett, like you've got the game in control there and your senior point guard just decides to throw it up for grabs. I mean, it's, it was an amazing moment, but it really was fun for Furman. They're actually making a documentary on their season from last year. Just three weeks ago, I did an interview with them when I was up here in New York the last time. I think Amazon is putting it out um, in the next month or so. I can't believe – let me look at his picture again. Put his picture up on the screen, frozen. That is a guy – look at him. He's <laughs> look haunted. At that He's haunted on behalf of Tony Bennett. And look at him, the disgust. He's still saying, senior point guard. He, yeah, Tony, you did everything you could, and I see you here. I, selfish Stan Van Gundy, who sees everything through the coach's prism, you're going to get your heart broken because your kid was an idiot. And that is shock and uh, compassion. For Tony Bennett. You're not even enjoying that. Look at you. You're suffering. You're shocked. Well, I, I wasn't really suffering because I did enjoy it for Furman, but but I was shocked. Not much shocks me. But not only was it a senior point guard, but Kia Clark, like his calling card is this is a smart point guard. And he is. I mean, that guy is a smart player. That's what he's all about, smart and disciplined. And in that moment, I don't know what happened, but he just threw the ball up for grabs. And then J.P. Pagese, who hadn't made a three and had been struggling shooting the ball even through their conference tournament, knocks down the biggest shot. I said to him the next day, uh, Furman's in Greenville, South Carolina, and I said, you know, I – I was talking to him after their practice the next day, and I said, I just want to spend one day in Greenville, South Carolina as J.P. Pagese. That's it. Just one day. Stan, thank you for joining us from a Denver hotel toilet. We appreciate it. It's the first time. Oh, this is New York City. Uh, oh, oh, New York City. New York City, New York City huh? toilet. Okay. Uh, a New York, New York City, City toilet. toilet. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, Stan Van Gundy, first ever appearance on the show from a New York City toilet. Thank you, Stan. All right, guys. Thank you. 
I want to continue this old media, new media conversation because I was interested in uh, Jeremy's perspective looking at this from a 20-year-old journalist's perspective or someone who aspires to some of the beliefs in journalism anyway or has seen some things uh, that have shown an evolving media. But the answer to Mike's question from before on uh, why I would get lumped in with old media is because I'm 55 years old. And how do I keep up with the young bucks in a difficult game when the gambling money's involved? I give you Thursday Thunder. I, give you. I was told I was told by DraftKings uh, through intermediaries because I try to have them not talk to me because I deeply, deeply want to be left alone that our last Thursday Thunder lacked information and enthusiasm. I thought that's the joke we were doing. I was informed. It also hit, by the way. No, but it, no, it hit? I, look, I was embarrassed yesterday by the general lack of enthusiasm around here. Like people weren't even doing uh, like they, nobody was That's trying. I know it's a different segment, but I'm saying when we are not very cleverly disguising programming that has a lack of interest in it. And then the picks are not creative or enthusiastic and it goes, oh, it's just red and that's all we've got. I thought that's the joke we were going for. I was told DraftKings wants something more serious. So morsels of information as to why we are picking this Thursday Thunder. What will deliver as okay. soon as I find out what it is. All right. Well, the last Thursday Thunder did come in and Juju picked it and he was three. He was three for three. It was a three leg parlay. Juju has done this correctly. Juju, no one's uh, Juju has won a couple of these and he's pouring in thought and research into them. Thursday Thunder is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Yeah. But this Ju is different. Ju Juju it. is the one who picked this Thursday Thunder. As well. Okay, uh, but I, what I'm saying is against the spread. My point is, it, look, if I'm going to get rep We got it. Totally different segment. They're the same. No, 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 no they're not. This is a, that one is against the spread. This, this is, is a parlay. It's Thursday it's a Thunder. Parlay. It's a parlay. It's parlay. parlay. And there's a double header on TNT tonight. Our friend Stan Van Gundy calling that first game with the Warriors at the Knicks in New York. That should be a really fun game between two teams that are playing pretty well. Steph always Obviously, plays well in the Garden too. Yeah, and the Knicks, you know, they haven't been playing well as of late. So. The first leg of our parlay, Steph Curry over 26 and a half points tonight. The marquee that in. player at that the in. Mecca Come on. national TV doing? game. Like yeah, no, this is where the stars shine. And I'm going to make it abundantly clear, guys. I did not make these picks. I am not gambling here. NBA, I am not the one doing this. We have the Heat at the Nuggets tonight in Denver. And this should be a great one. Look, it's a rematch of the 2023 NBA Finals. You're not going to be a homer forget. here. Are you going to be enough a people I'm not making that. these picks, Dan. I can't be a homer here. Potential Finals rematch. I'm not making these picks. You're not going to frame it. I am a not gambling. Jimmy Butler, over 19 and a half points. It's that time. It is that time. It's that, that time. time. It's that time of year, Dan. You know what time it is? Uh, it is time, time for Thursday Thunder. Which it's a is time. No, no, no. It's a time when Jimmy Butler cares about basketball. Different. Revenge on his mind. Ball out, boy. And the last leg, Bam at a bio over two and a half assists. Oh, oh low key. Good. Not enough people talking about it. He's back. Uh, yeah, I saw that Kendrick Perkins is saying that Sabonis is uh, MVP worthy conversation. I'm like, did you not just watch him what? play against Bam? Did you not just watch what that looked like? The disrespect I, for Bam Adebayo is palpable. I, I just don't think we know how to measure fair. defense is all. Sabonis is really good, though, to be fair. He is. No, but we have no idea how to measure defense. Right. right. But with uh, Bam, as you know, is a question of uh, the postseason. Yeah. And Which he was... The leading scorer outside of Jokic in the NBA Finals. Are you going to have that dog in you, literally? Or are you going to try to go through the motions right. and make me convince that you have that dog in you? He did it all last year. I uh, Hold on a second. Just I don't want to have another Bam out of body conversation. There's plenty of time. It's not time for that. Right. Not, whatever Jimmy Butler said, no, it no, it's not that time. time. It's not it that, that, time. that can be two months from now. I don't want to do it again. And I want shock collars on culture. I do. I want some. I didn't I, say. I, it. I want people to get zapped whenever that. That word might lower gets said. the team morale. Part yeah. of our. It also says culture, yeah. culture, culture on our tees for the show on yeah. DKN. Now rampant gas no, baggery is made an appearance. I told, I told them I didn't like that, and I told them to take it down. I'm feuding with DraftKings. Okay. Old media. So uh, 
Yeah, well, this is what's happening when I want to talk about new media, because one of the ways that new media, new media has made an appearance around here is that Mike Ryan has turned himself into a new hybrid business booster, not a journalist, but giving you journalists information that has been right uh, both in soccer and on college football. And I don't think people are noticing enough uh, because people don't totally understand the business of some of what happens around the NCAA, that the thing is crumbling so fast now that I'm not sure that people are understanding the macro consequences of what's happening in these weeks. I, I spoke to some people in and around the uh, lawsuit in Tennessee, and rightfully, everyone's celebrating. We, we, we took down the boogeyman, and there's a, a great deal of grave dancing going on right there. And my word of warning to these collectives is, Maybe give the NCAA a couple of wins here because we don't have a plan in place. And we explored that a couple of days ago uh, as it pertained to non-revenue sports. The NCAA is presently the governing body that is keeping those things going. And if the NCAA dies because no one has respect for its rules, what is to become of the non-revenue sports without a governing body? At the very least, it gets suspended for a while. Now, a lot of non-revenue sports in college athletics, a lot of them are women's sports. Title IX uh, offers some protections and guarantees. But what if this ruling still has to take Title IX into account? What does that mean? How does it get interpreted? What if it no longer becomes the interpretation of you have to have an equal number of sports for women's as you do men? Now, with this NIL ruling, you have to give the same amount of NIL to women's sports. Watch how quickly that undoes the sport. And the way that I think it undoes it is you have these schools realize they can't be in this game anymore because there is no way we're going to give the women the same amount of money as we give big-time college football, right? That's not even going to be a consideration. And Notre Dame's athletic director has actually hinted at this. I think, you know how you've said this is not really, it's amateurism. It's a uh, Minor league sports posing as minor league sports when it's really professional. Full-on licensing of these brands because they have so much brand equity. Notre Dame Fighting Irish gets licensed out to an entity. And if you've seen the landscape of sports, you may not like the entities that creep into college athletics or at least the branding that you recognize with college athletics. So my word of warning is you got to give this governing body some wins along the line because I don't think the administrators from the ones that I've spoken to are really prepared for how far this can unwind and how quickly it can happen. There aren't a lot of forward-thinking people in sports administration in this country, especially in college athletics. They are not prepared for a governing body to just disappear. They are not at all. Are you ready for Notre Dame fighting Irish football brought to you by Saudi Arabia? It can happen, and maybe I'm sounding like an alarmist. Maybe I'm the scientist in Independence Day warning you of a, an impending doom. But this thing can really unravel, and as we've seen in this country over the last few months recently, if you're going to open certain laws up to interpretation, including Title IX, this can go away that you're not fully prepared for Remember that capitalism conversation we were having yesterday, Dan? Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. <laughs> it's all ruined. About yeah, Wendy's? It's ruined everything. Yeah, we were having it about price gouging. But yep. I, I, we we all, just welcome money, no matter and, and what, what it is. And, and Any corporation, you mentioned blindly. Free, you, you mentioned free market capitalism. Right now, the, the shadowy governing body, especially in football, is the CFP, which was kind of put in place by the television networks. All right, so say March Madness is a big revenue generator. Who owns the rights to that? Turner, you're the governing body because you have this one event that kind of organizes the entire sport. What does that mean when rights go up if they're in charge? I think ESPN, like it's a very confusing deal with the CFP and their rights coming up. And is this a true free market for this considering how invested ESPN is in the sport? I, it's In the immortal words of Jose Canseco, Dan, this doesn't just open up a can of worms. It opens up a can of anacondas. Whoa. The immortal words of Jose Canseco. It'll never die. Um, that is anarchy. And you've been rooting, I've been rooting for the NCAA collapse <laughs> 
for a long time, but it is one of the great luxuries of the critic to be able to criticize when you don't have a solution in place. My anaconda don't, my anaconda don't, my anaconda don't want none unless you got bones on. I feel like he was getting somewhere poignant. Yeah. He's right about that, by the way. Chris Cody, what you just did is you just heard the word anaconda, searched it on the computer. Is that not the job? N- no. <laughs> Head on a swivel, buddy. He was going somewhere. It it was? They're clapping out there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, that should be your governor. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. That's a good idea. That's a yeah, good no, idea. That's, that's, that's a good, good idea for you. Cynthia. I'm excited about this. We told you about this yesterday. I believe it's the greatest set of spins in the history of the Price is Right. I don't believe <laughs> you, I don't believe you can do better than these three spins. Tyrone Jones is the master of this, but let's introduce him in the way he's used to being introduced. Let's introduce him the way that the Price is Right would introduce him. And Tyrone Jones! Right. He is, you are uh, the first yes. four contestants yes. on the prices. Yes. Right. Uh, this back row was hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, thank you, Tyrone, for joining us. Let's play the set of uh, – Mike hasn't seen this. The rest of you saw this yesterday, but Mike hasn't seen this. These are the three greatest spins in the history of this. He's got to beat a 90 and a 95. He's got to get to a full dollar. Uh, the two people in front of him have 90 and 95. These are the three greatest spins. <laughs> My mom, my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, and all my friends I met today on the way here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, just, just to taunt you. <laughs> just to taunt, taunt me. Nine, uh, five or ten. Five or ten. I mean, sometimes it's just... I mean, it's, right. hey, it's okay. <laughs> I'm glad I got to be here regardless of whatever. Good. But guess what? <laughs> oh my goodness. So that's as good as that can get. It's not going to get any better than that. That's the best it's going to be, right? No, of course not. He gets another spin after that. We're going to go through this with him. But he somehow gets another spin after that. You only get one. I'm sure you would have been satisfied with just this, correct? You would have been thrilled if this had been the end of your day. Oh, yes, of course. I was just happy to be there. I really was. <laughs> I really was. All right, so turn up the rest <laughs> of this. Mojo in it right now. Uh, you got a 1000 bucks. You're on your way to the showcase. Now you get an extra chance to take money from us. One spin, 5 or 15, gets you $10,000. Dollar gets you $25,000. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Come on, money. Man, somebody's throwing a 95, a 90, oh and then a dollar. I'm s- I, so explain, take us through it there. You, it didn't even look like you wanted to look at the last spin. You were already euphoric, right? Anything at that point is bonus. You're not expecting any of that. I I, I, I never would have thought that would happen, you know. Um, of course, like you said, with the 95, you're like, oh, my God. But if you look, I mouth to my wife in the crowd. I said, I still can get a dollar. You know, who I'm like, I still can, it, it still can happen. And, um... And next thing you know, you know, I hit the dollar. So I was totally excited. But that twenty five thousand, that that really blew my mind. Like, but if you look closely, before I spent the second spin, I looked up and I said a prayer. I, I, I asked my granny and I asked God. I was like, "Come on, let's," you know. And I flung it again, and it, it happened. It, it, it worked out. <laughs> what uh, take us through what you're feeling as you watch it again there? Because it seems like I don't know uh, you. You, I mean, imagine your life has changed some in the last couple of days. It's just I'm. I'm really. Um, I've been going through a lot the last couple of months. You know, I lost um, 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 a cousin, a grandmother, an aunt. My mom's going through health problems right now. So to just go there and um meet all the people before and 
make new friends and get the life and the energy I needed that. You know, I didn't, it didn't matter if I won or not, just to go there and experience it because I used to watch it with my grandmother. That's who I had on my shirt. And um, we used to watch Price is Right. So just to go there and get there, I just needed that that day. So it it was it was just great. It was it was great. And to watch it over and over and all the blogs and to read all the comments of how people said I touched their life and I made their day better and I made them smile and they cried with me. And you know, that's that's the win. That's that's the win right there. And 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 and, it, and it's continuing to go. And it's infectious and it's and I love the reciprocation that I'm getting from people because to make people feel good, that's what life is about. We 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 so detached from reality right now, we barely have a conversation with people. And just to say hello to somebody or speak to somebody can make things better for that person, just that for that moment, you know. So just to be there is just was great for me. It felt like a prayerful uh, spiritual moment to you, I guess. Connected, right? I mean, you're feeling right. I mean, you're feeling, <laughs> yeah, you're 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 feeling con connected to something divine when you're when you're asking for a prayer. You need help, and that's the answer. Right, right, and it was it was great. You know, faith, God, whatever your religion, whatever your belief may be, whatever you believe in. A higher power is real, and 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 you can feel it. And I just and I want to thank everybody. I really do. You know, everybody just been coming to my page, showing me love, and sharing their stories with me about their childhoods, experience with their grandparents or their family watching Prices Right. And it's just been overwhelming. I just love it. <laughs> uh, I have been told here by the shipping container that they brought a handful of items here. You're to guess what these items cost, and I'm to guess who brought them in. They bring them in from home here. <laughs> I mean, Dan, you're hosting. I thought I was hosting, but here we go. Welcome to our version of The Price is Right. We have here. All right, Tyrone, we're going to give you an item. I'm going to tell you a little about it. Then you got to guess the price without going over. And then, Dan, you have to guess who in the shipping container brought it in. This first item, it's a used skateboard. This micro user, this micro cruiser is designed for beginners, aged five, three to five, with a <laughs> concave design, a tapered shape, and a round kicktail that guaranteed a versatile performance. Make other kids around the block jealous with this rude boy skateboard. Tyrone, what's your guess? Ooh, seven fifty. That's the ding that he guessed, and the answer you are. I just realized this is a really easy game for him because he just has to guess. He just doesn't have to go over. He's not competing That's with right. anyone. That's correct. It is th $25. It's not even close. <laughs> you, you, but yeah. you're a winner. Yeah. It's not even close. No, it's not even close. He's terrible at this Three game. Three times more expensive. Now, Dan, who brought in the skateboard? This is a real game. Uh, well, you all have girls, and um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to guess this is Chris Cody. It is not. It is Roy. Roy. Wow. You said it was used? <laughs> I mean, what? that's just what it says on my what? sheet. You were oh, hiding. <laughs> Whose is this? Yeah, uh, it's mine. It's just not used. I don't know why he said it was used. Are you going to reuse it later? Yeah. <laughs> well, if I gift it to you. All right. Number two, Dan. We have some... A brand new bottle of Tenactin. Really? <laughs> Are you showering without flip-flops at the gym again? Have your see-through baseball pants been giving you jock itch? Ringworm? You want medicine that acts tough? Boom! Tough, tough acting Tenactin. Tough acting. Tough acting. Tyrone, what is your guess? Is you... It's well, <laughs> no, brand new. Like it's brand new. Well, it's in a bag. Well, it, look, I'm gonna it's guess. Brand new? It, no, it's a good question you're asking because I think it's purporting to be brand new. I think we're asking you for a price at brand new, but I'm pretty sure Mike Ryan brought this in from his shower or or his, or his medicine cabinet. I don't think it's brand new, but it's supposed Whoa, accusatory. to be. Accusatory. You think that's mine? <laughs> <laughs> it's up back. It's up back in Tanakin, Ten bucks. Ten bucks. He got it right again. The price is thirteen dollars. Got more expensive. I mean, you guys, now, Mike. You I mean, guys. Uh, Dan. Whose is it? Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's Mike Bryan. Yeah, it's Mike's. I mean, that is my I tough act in tonight. He just took it out of his. I mean, Ooh, please what? give it back. <laughs> Who, whose was it? This guy it's right here in the red right hat. There. He's disgusting. Hey, what, what? <laughs> I Mike, bought it in bulk. I actually got a better deal. That price is wrong. <laughs> Tyrone, you were saying we interrupted you as you were going to roast Mike. 
I, I, I really wasn't gonna roast him. I was just gonna, I, man. I hope everything gets better. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> it is getting better. All Thanks right, to boom. <laughs> Tough <laughs> acting to yeah. acting. All right, we got this here. We got <laughs> All right, our 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 next item. It's a pinwheel yeah. cap. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. nice. This stylish like dad hat blends comfort, style, and a rainbow colors with a skull, a scalp full of whimsy. Spin that propeller at your, oh, God, whatever. It's a hat with a propeller on it. <laughs> All right, what's your guess, Tyrone? 675. He's good at this game, folks. Yes, uh, it is $15. No, that's not good at the game. He's terrible at the no, game. No, he's great. He's but great, Dad. Whose hat is it, Dan? What? What? Oh, wait, go ahead. I'm actually... I'm, I'm just trying not to go over, right? Yeah, yes, you're good, dude. You're, you're three doing. for three. You're yes. crushing it. You can win this game by going 10 cents each time. <laughs> we didn't really think that part out. One dollar. <laughs> uh, this is Jeremy. Tony would never wear such a thing. That is my hat. <laughs> Woo! Right. How dare We're having dare. fun here. <laughs> How is a tough great hat guess. to no. so easy? Easiest right. guess right Judges, there. Judges, do we have time for one more? We do. We're going to do one more. And Dan, <laughs> it's a garment bag. It's a delightful garment bag. Are you sick and tired of changing out of that uncomfortable wrestling costume into the same old rumpled brown shirt? Blah, blah, blah. Right. It's a garment bag. Tyrone, what's your guess? 30 bucks. 30 bucks is the guess. Let's see if he's correct. Yes. He gets it right again. That's, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> it is $46. Uh, Dan, uh, whose bag is that? It's Tony's bag. It is Roy's bag. Oh, my God. Wait, oh, no. Oh, two whoa, items. Whoa, trick question. What happened to my item? Yeah, yeah where's I, my... Where's cut mine? for time. You guys fooled me. Uh, you guys tricked me. Uh, Tyrone, it was fun to watch. Has your life changed much over the last couple of days? Are you feeling... Uh, you're feeling extra special and connected to good things? I really am. You know, I just I just feel good. Like I said, I'm filled up with all the love and the, the energy from everybody. And I, I just I like it. And I appreciate it because I'm a happy person. I, I, I feed off of life and good energy. So I just it's like a, a total refreshing for the year. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. It was fun to watch. Uh, I hope they you don't know what else can leave you feeling totally refreshed. Wow. Boom. 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 <laughs> Tough acting to neck. <laughs> <acting to Nacton. laughs> Tough acting to Nacton. Boom. It won the segment. I mean, you didn't even try. You didn't even try. You brought you you brought in the from smiles your across people's faces yeah, yeah, is not something you can manufacture when you bring out the tough act and tenact. And many people hadn't thought about tough act and tenact in in twenty years. That's a winner. That segment, by the way, works because of that good man's charisma yes. and, and, and feel awesome. good story yeah. and my tough act and tenact. Mostly him, though. Uh, Elon Musk has uh, written on X, uh, put, quote, never went to therapy on my gravestone. Don't you love it when people wielding that kind of power are proudly not introspective? By the way, it's X, formerly known as Twitter. You got to say formerly known as Twitter every time you say X, by the way. That's what everybody else does. You didn't say it the second time. Though. The artist formerly known as Twitter. Uh, Draymond Green was talking about this the other day that he had to be talked into it a thousand times as if therapy is a source of shame, as if uh, needing some help uh, to to give someone you trust some vulnerability so they can give you some tools to better understand yourself and how your patterns uh, make you interact poorly with others. Like uh, therapy <laughs> as an uh, as a weakness is interesting. The conservative market correction is wild to behold. <laughs> just, no, we're not going to take you back to like 20, 2010. We're going to take you back to the 1950s. Also, like, they just, like, really want us to make children in the worst way possible. Yet in some states, like, suspend IVF. It's it's confusing. Liam Gallagher, keeping things slightly lighter. Have you seen how it is? I, Tony, do you know? Wait a minute. Jeremy and Tony might be too old. Oasis, different time. Uh, a rock star behaving like a rock star. Uh, and he and his brother. Is that any way, brother, here's Wonderwall? Uh, yes. That's okay. where that comes from. That's what I know. Yes. That's all I know. Okay, so Liam Gallagher says, uh, this is rock star from the rock star age. We don't make these people anymore. Says of Mariah Carey being inducted uh, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, her, her being nominated. Why are you smiling, Mike? Because Liam Gallagher makes me smile. The quote is, <laughs> uh, do me a favor and f*** off. <laughs> So hold on, yeah. tell me more about this guy. Yeah, What's yeah. up with this guy? I, I went to a Liam Gallagher set. He played three songs and told the audience <laughs> to f*** off. And I was so happy with it. I'm like, that's what I came here for. We have two guys on the screen. Which, which one is he? 
Uh, Liam's the one on the right. Yeah. Noel's the one on the left. They famously fought. Their story is great. They're just totally out of control. And and it's and they hate each other. <laughs> they, they brothers. They, yeah, yeah, there's so okay. much money yeah. there available for them for an Oasis reunion, but they just can't get along for And he it. says that of Mariah Carey, while Paul McCartney says this. Foreigner, not in the Hall of Fame. What the f***? That caught on yesterday. Foreigner so should good. absolutely yes, be in the Hall of Fame. Yes. Foreigner has got so many jams. Yes. It's crazy. Not if you go back and fame. celebrate their catalog, as I do, religiously, every three months, it just go to Foreigner, uh, Foreigner Essentials. Amazing. What the so is the Hall of Fame for rock and roll kind of like the Basketball Hall of Fame or like the Baseball Hall of Fame? What would you categorize it? Because obviously the Basketball Hall of Fame, kind of anybody gets well, in. Well, if Foreigner's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it's too hard to get into. The classes used to be more difficult, I think, is what it is. Because rock and roll, right, has changed over the years. If Mariah Carey is nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in her age demographic of now 25 years of music, because that's that's sort of the standing, is 25 years after your first record, you have to be able to kind of qualify within that group. And so Foreigner didn't necessarily sit at the top. They're sort of a Fred McGriff, you could say. Not in the Hall of Fame. You say that, and then look, Tony's usually a good gauge for these kind of things, because Foreigner, you don't know them really. But Not if in the I, Hall of Fame. If I sing, you're as cold as ice. I know that one. There you go. I've been waiting for a girl like you. That's all foreigner. No, they've got a ton of them. Yeah. Feels hey. like the first time. Oh, wow. Yep. I didn't know Hot blooded. Oh, I hear that on 105. Dude, 105 they got so <laughs> Box Hero. They've got wow. so many songs. It's five bangers I just heard. That is correct. And they've got more. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you guys a question about Tom Brady running. They just have video of him running a 40 faster at 46 years old than he did coming out of Michigan at the Combine when he was 20, 22. That's ridiculous. It was like it. superimposed, right? So like the video, you can see him clearly getting past his 20 year old self that's crazy Dan, that's talking about the tb12 method though. it's because no his, nightshades he's got those open hips right now where he is just slanging yeah. it's because his hey, dad yeah. wasn't a professional yeah. athlete that's why he didn't do it i'd like college. to issue a public apology to tony for that one uh because i think tony may have been right he talked about his basketball skill he said that if he had lebron james as a dad that he would be gary harris and honestly and wow. i very seriously if I had like Roger Clemens as a dad, I'd be Jesus Lazardo. Oh come on! What do you mean? What are you apologizing for? I, I was he right, was Dan. he was right. No, you that, know what? The training regimen for a great it's athlete. The next level. It's it takes you to the next level. And and look, I'm not disputing. What are you guys talking about? I am not disputing that to have LeBron's trainers as an average person would make you better. But not at, average. A good player. Right, at good. a high school level, yeah. correct. When you get those kind of access to people that are playing at a pro level and a regiment that is at a pro level, watching film, doing. You work will get on the- bet fa- You will get better faster, and then you will get buzz sawed in whatever it is that the G League is. Not like, in the Hall of Fame. Like totally buzz sawed. You're. Ro- I think you're wrong. Respectfully, Dan, you're wrong. Yeah, respectfully, respectfully. Dan, I'd be <laughs> an ace in Major League Baseball if I had had Roger Clemens as a dad. And you hmm. should listen to Tony because Tony opened our eyes back here to something we had never considered. Considered, and it makes me see him in a totally different light as it pertains to the bidet up. So when Greg did the Hee Haw 3 bidet up, and I th- we're probably going to get some audio of it now, um, I thought <laughs> probably for whatever reason, as the computer's buffering, um, I thought for whatever reason when he did the Hee Haw 3 bidet up, bidet up, I thought bidet up <laughs> was a shortened version for batter up. So wow. like the next batter bat-up. that came up, batter up, batter up, batter up. So I thought it was batter up. up. The next guy on deck is coming in because the other guy just got you know cranked out on a on a strikeout. It's he got what he actually it's actually cranked out. Not that though. My dad is just weird. Yeah, that's correct. And if it was on the really because that makes so much sense. No, that also what makes sense is that his dad is super weird. Uh, I did want to talk to Jeremy and Mike uh, specifically about what they were saying about new media versus old media, because it's all changing now. The landscape is all changing. And one of the things that Mike was talking about is that 
Uh, Bill Simmons might be old media to Pat McAfee, but Bill Simmons is a digital pioneer, like just like Pat McAfee is a digital pioneer. Uh, the, the, the whole atmosphere around all of this stuff is changing, and I do understand why anybody would be threatened by athletes coming into the workspace and trying to wrestle away with their competitiveness, especially about people clinging to journalism, people like clinging to their precious journalism. I understand why it is that McAfee and others want to kick down the doors on ESPN now that they see that the amount of money that's involved. And I also understand why old media would be threatened by that. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to be threatened by. It just feels like there's a misconception of what journalism is which aspires to objectivity. And I think one of the underlying issues with athlete-led journalism air quotes, this whole new media thing, is you get a very clearly, uh, clearly biased account of things. And because it's their truth, it gets conflated with the truth. And if you don't have someone to check one side of it that is objective, then that's not actual journalism. And I know how that lands with a good amount of the audience. Who cares is how it lands. Who cares yes. whether it's actual journalism or not. I just heard Chris Paul tell Dwayne Wade that the only reason he wasn't traded to Miami is because they couldn't agree on who would wear number three. <laughs> that's that's the dumbest thing that, I've ever yeah, heard. No, 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 fabricated. I think that that's a perfect example of why you – what that segment was missing between the two, because, yes, the relationship between the two gives you a nugget that you had never heard before. Uh, and we were talking before the show, Jeremy, conspicuous by his absence in that conversation is, when does this timeline occur? Why aren't we mentioning Chris Bosh? Is he in that package? When does this happen? Yeah. And I think that's where you could really benefit from an objective yeah. journalist type to be like, hold on, you guys have grins on your faces right now as, as, you're, as you're talking about this. Are you joshing me right now? Is this serious? When did this happen? How did this land with Chris Bosh? Was he in the deal? But no, because you get a certain aspect of the truth and you don't get the follow-ups. Now, athletes are totally capable of the follow-ups, but there is an objective prism that I'm dying as a consumer of these things to be applied there that is missing in part because that that is the construct. You don't get two in there. You get a version of the truth, maybe not the complete truth. That's where when you get referred to in the McAfee clip as sort of old media as opposed to new media. And or we talk positioned about, as such. Right. Sort, sorry, positioned as such. It, it's, it's not necessarily because of the actual style of media, because what we're doing right now is all digital. This is all a, a new media landscape in the way that this show interacts with the Internet and consumers. Yet, by being positioned as old media, it's really just because you stem from journalism. Right. You stem from a world where you're asking follow up questions, tougher questions, trying to get to some version of the truth. And in that entire episode, you have McAfee discussing Aaron Rodgers, for example, and saying that what he did with Rodgers is a form of journalism because you're hearing Aaron Rodgers's truth, which could be where you got lumped into, you know, as Pat put it, talking about him. Uh, I think on the balance of things, we've been 99.9% positive. Well, when I know it comes one of Pat. the things that happened. But the Rogers stuff might have landed on the wrong side of things with him. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I think happened here is Lucy was down on him on game day, and I was following her conversation on talking about it seems like Pat is re responding sensitively to things. I understand why he would be sensitive. There are a whole lot of people that he couldn't told told him he couldn't do it his way, that way. And then he gets to ESPN and runs into what was their previous corporate infrastructure that was how journalists got run by a production company. And he buzzsawed the top of that because he's coming in with his own ownership. He says on all the smoke, he says, I don't have fucking bosses because he doesn't. Because unless you're talking about Pitaro, he made a deal at the top of Disney to rent his product to them because the whole game has changed. Like, it's flipped over. Everything is different now. No, he shifted a paradigm, no doubt. Yeah, and, and you get huge, immense, uh, 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 massive amounts of credit for shifting a paradigm. Mike's right in terms of journalism sort of changing in the way that athletes are capable of asking these follow-up questions. We've seen athlete after athlete be a part 
of ESPN for so many years where they sort of came to the middle on journalism principles where the journalists had to come down to the entertainment side. But now what you're seeing is, hey, let's just josh around and not really have any follow-up conversation. Well, I, Two I, joshing around reference. I, no. Well, I, part, of, part of the argument was that, like, if they do a documentary on Aaron Rodgers, the access that I'm affording America to, that's going to be in the in the documentary. Right, a slanted is it, documentary is not, produced by Aaron Rodgers, it, probably. Is that not journalism? And some might say, no, not actually, but, you know. I will tell you. It's subjective at this that point. That <laughs> all of us having more access to more information serves everybody. And I will also tell you that Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson and Shannon Sharp will all get better at interviewing. They will make mistakes and they will get better at checking people people as they learn how to do this part of their jobs better but they're gonna learn faster because there's a lot of money in this game and they've all seen now they can compete for it look at what happens to Shaq's podcast he's paying attention again and he started at the advent of media been following this guy for a long time he's been following us for a long time and he's got one of the grittiest coolest stories in sports media because he basically made it through the meritocracy by being better at twitter than most people the jenkins and jones podcast he's the co-host new episodes drop monday and thursday on the volume network tyler per year dragonfly jones on twitter with us got a lot of things that i want to uh, cover with you but the first thing I wanted to do is because I I've noticed that you seem to have do you have a love is blind obsession or do oh. you, is, is it a guilty pleasure what's happening with you and love is blind are, are you tapped into it do you watch it uh, I don't but our crew does they love uh, they I'm locked pay. in I'm locked in bro can we talk about it's, Jimmy do you want to talk about Kenneth do you want to talk about who do you want to talk about first it's amazing I mean every man on this season is trash right Jimmy's like, the worst like, Jimmy's the worst like so. bro Every, every man except that dude, um, the 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 plain face guy who's got the Latina girl, who I think that's gonna be the only couple that makes it. Um, y'all know who I'm talking about. He yeah, dude yeah, looks like yeah. every yeah, you're right. player ever, right? Like I think I think that couple's gonna make it, but everyone else is terrible, bro. Terrible. I don't. I'm not rooting. Like I watched this for the train wrecks. I'm not gonna lie to you. I did not watch this for the fairy tale happy um endings. And it looks like we are gonna get a lot of those this season. I was just telling Billy that I'm gonna just tune into the yeah. final episode just because I kind of like seeing when people get left yeah. at the altar. <laughs> yes, that's the best. I feel like such a terrible person, but these people weren't right for each other anyway. It's like it's best for all parties involved when they don't go through with this. I mean, it's an it's an absurd concept. You're marrying someone who you've only known for like two or three weeks. You know, it's crazy. Chris Cody just whispered in my ear. I could hear Jessica's lunch. Yeah, it sounded good. It was really good. <laughs> I want to play for you some sound here because uh, we reached out to the people who got thrown around by Cam Newton. And, really? uh, yeah, we were told uh, by the guy who got most thrown around that they were, quote, addressing the matter internally. And, uh, and then they went on an interview that was apparently with their PR person, I believe. Uh, I'm not totally sure. But let's just listen to the sound of the people explaining uh, how and why it came to be that Cam Newton threw them around. So Cam has an organization. Mm -hmm. It's not just one team. He has an organization. So it's just been a lot of trash talk, you know, from, you know what I'm saying, more so his side. Just out of nowhere, just talking crazy to us for no reason. It's like, it's not nothing new. Like, I've been around bro for five years. So, mm -hmm. like, this typical Cam Newton behavior. But Steph, you was right there. Yeah, so oh, they you talking. You was listening to the whole thing. So yeah, you heard yeah. him and you walked up. So Let Steph walk up there. Oh, okay. What's the, and as I'm know? walking up with Steph, Cam is in Steph's face. I made y'all responsible for everything y'all do, whatever. The, then he grabs Steph. Okay. So me being my little brother and I'm walking up a flight of steps and I see a 6'6 six, six guy grabbing my brother. And that's the footage that everybody that's sees. That's what everybody's seeing. Okay. Like, so that was the first altercation yeah, that everybody nothing, saw. Nothing else right ever happened before okay. that. Nothing else ever happened. Like, nobody's okay. seeing like, how he was talking crazy, talking crazy this, like the past that. two days. Like, yeah. Nobody's seen that. Like, I say this as the person who requested a conversation with them. No mm -hmm. one is here for their explanation of what happened. No, no. <laughs> I, I think Bomani hit the nail on the head when he said, we don't care if, if uh, you are in the right. We we are laughing at you because you were in the stupid. And I think that's the perfect way <laughs> to explain it. I will say my favorite thing about that ass whooping that Cam gave to all those people is it was such a lawsuit proof ass whooping that he gave, right? He he could have thrown some haymakers and cracked some faces, you know, cracked some orbital bones and some jaws, but it was just straight tosses, bro. Like, you know, that he you know, he's been the game manager, game changer guy. That he game managed that ass whooping that he handed out that time. <laughs> what what the game what do you believe is more impressive there? Do you believe the hat never moving is more impressive than never needing to throw a punch that would result in a lawsuit because you're good at rich people throwing people around without a lawsuit? 
the, the, the hat for sure sticks out to me that, because that is a big hat, right? It's not like a, a baseball cap like I'm wearing now. It's like a magician top hat, right? Like he's got a rabbit in that mother. So that's staying on his head. He's unbothered, just tossing these dudes, taking on four guys at once. Cam's a different dude. Most football players are different dudes, and people need to realize that, man. I, I'm wondering why it is that they wouldn't. It must be because he's a quarterback, right? Even though he might be the most physical of the quarterbacks we've seen. Right, right. Did you see that that clip of when he met Luke Keekley, um Super Bowl weekend, and they had a really cool moment where they hugged? Cam lifted that guy off the ground. He had can he had Luke uh, Luke uh, Kukukli's little toes, you know, just dangling in the air. And that guy was a destroyer of worlds during his prime, right? Like Cam is just he, he's he's not just big for a quarterback. He's big for a football player, right? Like he's bigger than most like linebackers, dude. We all just want to be held like that, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My little toes Absolutely off the ground. Right. <laughs> Are Clay and AD going to get married or not? No, absolutely not. Right? Absolutely not. He's been absolutely. he's dropped already too many times. Like, yo, I don't want to cheat on you for real. I really don't want to do it. I really don't want to. But do I'm it. going like, to. Well, what? Like what? <laughs> but I got to deliver these jet skis. I can't be the man you need, <laughs> right? Like, like Clay is so full of. I'm a entrepreneur. Yeah, I'm going to tell you when everything made sense for this dude. Because I was like, he's got a really big ego. He's full of himself. Where did this come from? When we found out he was a track dude, I was like, okay, that makes sense. If y'all know track guys, they are a different breed. Like, I guess a better frame of reference would be all NFL wide receivers were track guys at one point. You know, right? And we all know how big a divas, you know, those guys are. So everything made sense once I found out that dude was a track star. And, and uh, All-American at South Carolina, right? Like, he was no slouch. You have been someone who's been a, an astute observer and uh, perpetually cracking jokes at the expense of Russell Wilson. What do you make of his present predicament? Um, it feels it feels like a, a bit of a heel turn here, right? Um, this guy was like the ultimate company man. You know, um, we've had foot, um, his, his teammates go on record saying that, you know, he was just someone who just always sided with the suits, with the coaches, with ownership, like – Marshawn Lynch talked about how he had to, when he wanted to reach out to Russell Wilson, he had to go through like a third party. And then, you know, Russell would call him from like a block number. Like he's just like a guy who has never been pro worker. Right. But now he's got this whole thing going where, where, you know, you, 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 you see him have the sit down interview where he's kind of, you know, spilling the beans on how, uh, you know, how bad Denver did him. And he's got this whole little workout video. I don't know if y'all saw that where he was like married to the game, right? You know, which is which is really kind of a clever angle for his team to push because the whole connotation there is, you know, I'm a guy who honors promises. I'm a family man. I'm a husband. Unlike the Denver Broncos who just reneged on their word, right? Like that's the connotation there. So it's a really clever angle for them to go with on that. But I do not think it's genuinely Russell like fighting the system or or you 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 know being on the labor side of things here. He's just trying to show other teams like he still got. It. He just still wants to get that bag. That's it. But do you look at this and wonder if we've ever had an athlete quite like this that we look at this way? I, a Rod uh, fills a similar place when he was playing at the top of his powers. Bear, but one of the great offenses with customers that you can have is someone that we don't believe is authentic. That it's yeah. like a lot of veneer, a lot of packaging, and I he I don't know that it's insincere for him. He might be that kind of um, you know square. Yeah, yeah, he, he he just might be. He's from Richmond. Um, he went to a high school out here, collegiate private uh, school, where you know it. If, if you're from Richmond, you're you know him being the way he is and knowing that he went to collegiate makes complete sense, right? But um, yeah, I I I don't even think it's him like posturing or or him you know trying to you know keep you know develop a brand. I think he's just really a different dude. Like, bro, Russell Wilson should be like one of my favorite football players ever, right? Like, like I said, he's a Virginia guy. He's married to Sierra. Like he should, he's a Super Bowl champ. He should occupy like the same place in my heart for Virginia legends, like, you know, Allen Iverson and Michael Vick do. But I just, I just don't see it for him. I'm, I'm just not a fan of the dude, bro. But what I'm saying to you is, do you understand how strange it is or how unusual your personality has to be for you not to be able to have all of those things in your corner and have have us receive you as cool like that's a lot of advantages yeah. you have right right exactly my point I, like i said on paper he should be like one of my favorite athletes ever but but the dude is just like a robot he is just like a company man robot bro company man 5000 or whatever
Are you like me? Because I admitted something with a bit of shame on yesterday's show. You must not be like me. You must have known this already. When the Clipper logo came out, I was unaware until the time uh, that the new logo came out that the Los Angeles Clipper, the Clipper refers to a boat. I, I learned that when the logo came out and felt a decent amount of shame admitting it. Oh, you you are not alone. I unfortunately knew it because I'm a nerd who just like Google all the time when I'm bored, but I did know it was a boat because I know they had the little San Diego history and all that. What did you think the Clippers were before? Like I, hair clippers? I, 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 no, I just hadn't considered it. I never, I didn't, I, it's not something, I hadn't had the thought until I saw the boat on the logo. What did you think of the logo? Oh, sh um, I hate it. Um, you know, uh, they rolled out that logo and bro, I was just so underwhelmed and it, it feels like it's not just uniquely because of the Clippers. It kind of feels like there's just been this whole movement that's been going on in sports over the past couple of decades when it comes to logo designs where they're just not fun anymore, dude. And it makes me think back. And I feel like the, the 90s were the last fun decade of sports logos. And then everything shifted to logos that look, you know, that took themselves way too seriously. Like, I don't know why that should happen, but it for sure happened. And I hate it. Um, and, you know, I think as like, incredible and enthralling and entertaining as sports are sports at their core are silly right like basketball consumes my life and it's just a bunch of dudes in matching short sets throwing a ball at a hoop all this shit is silly and i feel like the best sports logos the best sports mascots are the ones that lean into the silly and not the serious and i feel like we've just got way too far removed from the silly and all this it's it, it's so boring it's so drab well you are a style connoisseur you are a fashion critic so how about you help us with the top five rules for a good team logo do you think you could put that together off of the top of your head we'll go five four three two one i'll give you a second to think about it certainly you are you are somebody who who fancies himself an expert in this realm right this is something that you can deliver without a whole lot of thought correct yeah you know free game right here for sure all right number five okay so like I said, when it comes to, I think that that logos need to lean away from the serious and lean back into the silly, right? Because the silly logos just flat out look cooler. There's no other way to say it. Like the 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 Clippers new rebrand, that shit looks like Kylo Ren, bro. It looks like a, a fucking Sith Lord. You know, it looks like a Star Wars character. And I and you know, as Exhibit A for like downgrade. Of, of this is like the Charlotte Hornets logo. Like if you look at the iconic 90s logo, which I loved as a kid, like when the, when the Hornets, you know, hit, it was a game changer. And you look at what they did to him and you, you, you know, you look at how they reach how they changed that. Like they turned that into the Batmobile, bro. And, and it's, and it's like, at first the Hornets logo was amazing. Iconic even, you know, I love those big goofy shoes and those dumbass gloves. Like, he was perfect. And they turned him into, like, a syringe or some shit now. I hate the new logo. Chris Cody, your timing was a little off there. He also needs to help you on the front end with a quick answer uh, at the beginning so you can get the fanfare in. Number four. Okay. it's Number four would be, it is okay for your logos to look nice and cute. They don't have to <laughs> right? Like, they don't have to be imposing or intimidating. It's cool if they just look cute. Like, take a look at the Baltimore Oriole, for example, right? I think that is one of the best logos in all of sports. And that is adorable, right? He's just smirking away, living the dream. It's such a good logo. And I'll put, like, the Baltimore Oriole up against any bird logo in sports. Like, I'll put it up against the Philadelphia Eagle, the Seattle Seahawks, you know, the Atlanta Hawk, the Atlanta Falcons. Whoever you want to bring, this little cute smirking mother is mopping them all up. It's such a good logo. He is cute. He, I've never really He's realized adorable, that until right? now. He's adorable. That's Try to pinch those point. cheeks. Right. Number three. Okay, so we I had this conversation on Twitter and a Twitter user named Tommy Wrong the Third made a great point that we need to bring back mascots who are actually playing the sport in, in sports logos, right? I feel like where sports logos peak. When you see a mascot playing the sport in this in that team's logo, it's perfect. Like the New England Patriot getting ready to snap the ball, the Toronto Raptor and the Vancouver Grizzly playing basketball. Um, you know, the St. Louis Cardinal getting ready to step to the plate. We have, you know, the San Jose Shark biting a, hike, a hockey stick in half because, you know, yeah, he doesn't play by the rules. He's a shark, right? And those are all like 10 out of 10 logos. And that to me is with Sports Peak, when we have like actual mascots playing the sport in the logo for sure. How does a clipper play basketball, though, if it's a boat? That's why I think it should be Clippy playing basketball. How about that? <laughs> right, right. I, there was someone put out a logo of some hair clippers and I was like, bro, that's perfect. I love that.
Like we don't have to be committed to this this unknown ship that this team is named for. We can lean into like the, you know the barbershop side of this. There's there's a market there. There's a lane there. Number two. Um, you know, like I said, I think the vibes were just better with silly sports logos. You need good vibes with your logo, right? And at that point, I present the old Milwaukee's Bucks logo and the current Milwaukee's Bucks logo, right? Like, you look at the old school logo. Current's better. Oh, yeah, the old school. Like, bro, that dude is just chilling. Just good vibes. Not a worry in the no, world, like right? old one's great. He's so cute. Right? Right? And that was the logo of the Bucks teams that had, like, you know, Kareem and Oscar Robinson, right? Where... You know, I'm sure there were like expectations for that duo to win championship just year after year. You got the flat out best basketball player in the league and the best all around player in the league. But look at this guy. He doesn't care about any of that. Right. There's not a care in the world. He's got his cute little sp uh, sweater on, spinning the basketball on his hoof. He's just whimsical as fuck out here living the dream. I love it. <laughs> and finally, the number one key, the number one rule for a good team logo is. The sillier, the better. You need and you need to be silly, right? Like. Like, you know, with the Clippers logo, I get all they incorporated. So I get that they incorporated the ship in it and the, the C and the compass. But, you know, something can can be brilliant, but not ambitious. And that's what I what it, what it feels like with the Tony, Clippers. why are you criticizing his top I'm five? I'm not criticizing his top five at all. It just feels like it could have been a top two that we could have said be silly and then do things that aren't as serious, which feels okay, like, kind of like a top two, one. No, but a top five Ooh. is what I asked him for. I didn't ask him for a top two. I asked him for a top five. Dragonfly, what do you oh. think about this love triangle, though, between Jimmy, what? Jessica, Chelsea, and also Trevor now coming into the picture <laughs> after this? Very important. I didn't see the new drops, but I... But, uh, oh, buddy! Jessica. Yeah, I know I'm in for a doozy, but as far as, as... I still do not believe that Jessica is still hung up on that dude. I thought, bro. Mike, like, Mike drop on it, though. On. Mike drop on it. You're going to choke when you see me. You're going to need an EpiPen. Oh, I was like, come bars. on. Those are bars, man. Like, that was some Game of Thrones level writing right there. That was some Cersei shit, dude. Like, I was just amazed when she said that. But I still do. I, I'm still so. I don't know what they see in Jimmy. And I know I sound like a hater, but I just do not know why these women are going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over that dude, bro. Team, he's Timu uh, Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> he looks like Doug Funny, bro. New episodes drop Monday and Thursday on the Volume Network. He is the co-host of Jenkins and Jones. Thank you, Tyler. Appreciate the time. Always a pleasure, man. Appreciate y'all having me.